Okay, we can go back on the record, Maggie. We are now on the record. Thank you. Um, we'll resume our hearing of August 6, 2024, um, and we have some additional uh, guests today. Um, we have John Bartholomew and Tom Nash from Barth Bartholomew and Associates, Brian Briscombe from the RAND Corporation, and Nancy Kane from the Harvard School of Public Health, who will provide some additional information and insights into um, national trends and some insights on Vermont-specific hospitals. Um, I'll turn it to Ms. Barabee. Ms. Barabee, do you want to introduce the speakers? Yeah, sure. So, um, so we have Brian Briscombe from RAND, who will be our first speaker, and he can talk a little bit about his background before he dives in. Um, and then John and Tom Nash, who will go second, um, used to work in Colorado, and a lot of their work comes out of um, that process. And then um, I'm not sure if Nancy's on yet, but she will join us soon, and we will introduce her in that transition. So, Brian, do you want to start us off? Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Brian Briscombe. I'm currently leading the RAND study. Um, and this study has been going on for many years, as you all know. Um, Chris Whaley was the former PI. Uh, just so you all know, he um, left RAND. He's at Brown University right now. So um, he was uh, the first author of this report. Um, wanted to acknowledge that and did a lot of this research, led a lot of this research. Um, also, Rosie Kerber is on the call. She led the programming uh, efforts for getting through this mountain of claims data across the United States, along with Dan and Aaron. Peter Hussey, our VP at RAN, I believe, is also on the call. And uh, my background is in hospital cost analysis and uh, healthcare economics. Um, shall I share sh the slideshow now or are there more introductions? I think you can go right to your slideshow and get into the meat of your presentation. Okay, great. Thank you for having us today. And um, let's see if this slide will advance here. There we go. Okay, so usually the first um, thing to put in context is that the RAND study is not looking at all of healthcare. It's we're focused on hospitals and the commercially insured folks um, going to hospitals. So the commercially insured people under employer sponsored plans cover about half of all Americans, around 160 million people. And so this is relevant to a, a whole lot of people, um, the hospital's um, costs for employer-sponsored plans. You can see that in 2022, if healthcare costs were about 1.3 trillion and the hospital portion of that 486 billion, it's a little less than um, half of all the healthcare costs, but it's a good chunk that we're gonna focus on when we look at just hospitals. Um, in the context of uh, deductibles and premiums rising faster than um, wages and inflation, uh, this issue, of course, has become central to a lot of policymakers across the US um, as healthcare uh, costs a lot of money. Um, one uh, important disclaimer before we get into the results and the data, um, RAND is very careful. You'll notice in our reports and in this presentation, we never um, try to say what the right price is. Uh, we're not the ones purchasing this health care. Um, only the purchaser knows whether the price that they're paying is acceptable or you know, they can form their own opinions based on the data that we help to share with the world. Um, so normally purchasers such as employers or unions, state governments, um, they can use this report analysis to decide for themselves if the prices they're paying align with the value they're getting. And of course, they'll want to look at other data too, such as quality and convenience. Um, 
There's also the legal angle. Um, a lot, a lot more awareness these days that self-funded purchasers have a fiduciary legal responsibility to act in the interests of their employees and uh, dependents. Um, and it's just kind of important to note that it's impossible to fulfill this legal obligation without knowing the prices you're paying. And this RAND study is often the first time, especially small employers or, or many other employers, this is often the first time they've actually seen the, the overall price levels that they're paying. A little bit of study history to provide context. Um, as a lot of you know, this this has been going on um, uh, around a decade now. And in round one, we just covered one state, Indiana. It was kind of a pilot. Um, by round two, we had covered about half of the states in the US and just started adding all pair claims database uh, information and claims to the study started to break out um, in a more granular level the the results, splitting inpatient, separate from outpatient, et cetera. And that's when we also started to publish standardized prices, which we'll talk a lot more about today, in addition to relative prices. Um, by round three, we had gone pretty much national, uh, every state except for Maryland. We had added a few more APCDs. We had about six APCDs by round three. Um, we broke out professional claims from the facility claims. I believe in previous rounds, we only had facility claims. And um, we also started looking at service lines, um, groups of services, and reporting um, relative prices for them. Round four and five were were mainly just focused on expansion, uh, more claims data so that we could um, make clear that, you know, there's a sufficient sample um, to actually see what the relative prices are. Um, by round four, we're up to 11 APCDs. This round, 12 APCDs. And we also are able to do a lot of other um, subsets of of pricing, looking at comparisons of hospitals to ASCs, looking at drug infusion prices. And this month, um, we'll be adding emergency department prices. So what do we do in each round? Um, it all begins with spending more than a year uh, getting data use agreements and getting the claims data from basically three sources. Sometimes it's directly from the employers uh, in their data warehouse. Sometimes, uh, as I mentioned, 12 APCDs um, collecting the data and then um, and then handing it over to RAND for use in the study. And sometimes health plans uh, participate directly and, and send the data directly to RAND. We measure prices in two ways. And again, um, we're going to get into more detail of exactly the methods we're using to, to measure it in these two ways. There's the Medicare benchmark um, percentage that we publish. And then there's the price per case mix weight dollar standardized price that we publish. So then we create a public report, which we most recently published in May. That was the round five report. And we post an accompanying um, Excel file that's also downloadable and open to the public. And in the Excel file, um, that's where you find the data on each individual hospital named and each, each system uh, by name. Uh, you can also find a lot more breakdown of inpatient, outpatient, facility professional, all the ways we've sliced the data. And lastly, we create private reports for any data contributors in the study that wish to purchase a private report. So certain employers, they want us to subset just their claims. They don't want to see 
um, the statewide average, they want to see what they pay. And so they're able to purchase a private report. We send it just to them. Um, OK, so the first way uh, we publish the results is by comparing what commercial payers um, are, are actually paying for real claims. Um, against what Medicare would have paid for the exact same hospital and the exact same claim. So we're using this comparison to Medicare um, as a benchmark. It's not meant to imply that Medicare is the right price and, and that um, the commercial price is, is that much higher than Medicare. It's just a unit of measurement that is convenient to use, it's available across the United States. It's open to the public to see exactly how Medicare does their pricing. And so it's a convenient unit of measurement with which you can compare one hospital to another or one state to another or one year of prices to another year of prices. It basically puts everything into the same unit of measurement to allow and facilitate quick comparisons that are very easy to comprehend. Um, so in the table I put here, for example, you, you could have three hospitals in the same city. I think in this example, I just picked some three from an, a city, the capital of Alaska. And, um, you know, you can notice in the highlight that differences in hospital prices become very clear when you when you put them side by side, hospitals B and C, their relative prices for outpatient are are significantly higher than hospital A's um, relative prices for outpatient. Just a simple example of comparing and using Medicare. Notice the point isn't necessarily that hospital A is more than twice what Medicare pays. The point is that hospital B costs more than hospital A. So the other way to look at these uh, results is by standardized prices. And um, this may be particularly interesting to Vermont because, you know, we publish these standardized prices in an acknowledgement that Medicare as a denominator isn't always the best way to compare one hospital with another. And the reason why it's not always the best is sometimes Medicare is adding payments for teaching hospitals, critical access hospitals. Um, the uh, dish payments are different depending on the hospital. And so it's not an absolutely apples to apples comparison if the two hospitals you're comparing have one Medicare um, payment system and, and, and the other has a different Medicare payment system. So to eliminate those um, differences in Medicare payments, we publish standardized prices separately, and that does not include any adjustments for being a teaching hospital or, or being a critical access hospital. In Vermont, there, there's, I, I believe, a, a larger number of critical access hospitals than your average state. And so standardized prices might be a very interesting metric. And um, in this presentation, um, I've gone ahead and charted both the, the relative prices and the standardized prices for, for everything. Um, and, and so you could kind of pick and choose which one you want to look at. Um, the problem with standardized prices, the reason they're not quoted as often in press reports and when people look at the study, is it's not as intuitive as relative prices. When you're talking dollars, it can be harder to make a comparison. You know, like in the table here, Hospital A, um, I mean, obviously you can see it's you know more expensive than Hospital B uh, by standardized price, but it's it's harder to calculate in your head what percent more or, you know, the dollar amounts. And also notice you can't really compare inpatient with outpatient, the left column with the right column is easily because inpatient stays tend to, you know, be more expensive than an outpatient 
service or unit of service. So it's it's a little more difficult to do the comparisons with standardized prices, but it, it can be done. And standardized prices are calculated by using Medicare's case mix grouping and relative weights. So basically what we're doing is Medicare says um, a heart surgery is 40 units of service and a knee surgery is 10 units of service. You know, so, so you take the dollar amount, the allowed amount paid for the heart surgery and the allowed amount paid for the knee surgery, and you adjust them for that case mix, uh, that relative weight um, that Medicare has given to them. And that allows you to compare apples with apples in terms of units of service that a hospital is providing. All right, so let's get into the findings now that we've um, covered the, the background and the context. So we'll start with the nationwide findings, and then we'll move on to the Vermont specific findings. Um, nationwide, we looked at more than 4,000 hospitals and more than 4,000 ambulatory surgical centers. And again, we're just looking at the commercial claims. Um, we see a wide ver variation in hospital prices across the United States and even within states. Um, we see that generally facility fees are higher than professional um, claims relative to Medicare. But sometimes, rarely, uh, you will find a case where the professional claims are, are higher and the facility um, claims are lower relative to Medicare. Um, we looked at prices for hospital outpatient departments. Um, generally, for the same services, they're higher than the prices at ASCs. We looked at prices for infused drugs in a hospital setting tend to be higher priced than in uh, other settings where you could infuse drugs. And um, so we published all those, but we don't get into the ASC data or the infused drugs data very much in this presentation. We'll, we'll focus on um, the bigger picture. So one thing, having a nationwide sample of more than 4,000 hospitals lets us do is plot um, the statistical uh, correlation between the market share of a hospital and its relative price um, as, as we you know calculate a share of Medicare. So the relative price here is plotted on um, the x-axis and uh, the market share um, as a percent of discharges, patient discharges in the in the service area um, is plotted on the other axis. And so, for example, the dot you see on the very far right, that's going to be a hospital that has a, a large market share. More than half of all patients discharged in that service area, in that market, are from that hospital. And to simplify this chart, we've grouped like a group of hospitals. So that dot represents, um, you know, a few hundred hospitals. So over to the right, if you have a higher share of all the discharges, you tend to have a higher relative price. So the slope of these dots, as represented by the red line, is going up. This indicates a positive correlation between having more market share and having higher relative prices. So way over on the left, you'll see, you know, a hospital with very small market share having lower relative price. Uh, the statistical analysis um, revealed that 18% of price variation among hospitals can be explained by market power. Um, the second chart that we're able to do nationwide with the large data set is plotting the same thing, um, but this time one of the axes, axes is um, the sh hospital share of non-private insurance discharges. So how many, what percent of their patient discharges are from Medicare and Medicaid patients? 
And so when you plot this, like the dot on the very right side, you'll see that they have more than 80% of their discharges are insured by Medicare and Medicaid. While the dot on the left side representing another group of hospitals, the share of public payer discharges is less than 20%. And you'll notice the, the relative price of these groups of hospitals is basically the same, whether you're having a large share of public payer discharges or a small share of public payer discharges. There's no correlation with your relative price. So this little um, example, just basically the conclusion is that it doesn't show any evidence that the share of Medicare and Medicaid patients is driving uh, your prices. Let's get to Vermont specific findings now. So for Vermont, um, we had sufficient claims data to publish relative prices for 14 hospitals uh, and nine systems. And again, like most states, wide variation in hospital prices can be observed within Vermont. Um, overall, Vermont, um, if you look at outpatient and inpatient services, everything together, um, Vermont's relative price is a little bit above the national average. And um, the outpatient services tend to be a bit higher and the inpatient services a little bit lower. Um, at the system level, there's a price range, a relative price range from 148% of Medicare up to a little more than three times Medicare. And here are the statewide results um, charted. Um, I want to mention here that um, Vermont's average overall at 283%, um, we've actually just updated our data file. We were able to find more claims nationwide that were not published in May. And also we were able to remove some duplicates, some duplicate claims. So overall, we were able to um, basically publish, we're, we're planning to publish a version 5.1, if you will, of the RAND study, just a, a slight marginal uh, improvement and, and increase in the amount of claims data for our study. So if you notice that there's just this slight marginal change, for example, in Vermont uh, having 283% of, of Medicare, or maybe you notice the nationwide average of 255% of Medicare is that slight difference from what we published in May, 254%. It, it, it increased one percentage point uh, with the new claims data. So just in case you all notice this slight difference in the data I just wanted you all to be aware that we're we're going to republish um, a 5.1 data set in a couple weeks. You're the first to see the the slight um, change here. Okay, so Vermont, um, as I said in the last slide, a little bit above the national average overall, and looking just at the inpatient facility claims. Um, it's 230% of Medicare, a little below the national average. And looking at just the outpatient facility claims, it's 328% of Medicare, a little above the national average, 14th highest. Looking just at professional prices, just the claims that um, the doctors and other professionals are paid for the hospital visit. Um, Vermont is 226% of Medicare, um, which is lower than the facility relative prices, but high relative to other states in general, fifth highest state. And now we can look at um, healthcare systems. 
Um, again, we're going to look at the relative prices first, and we're also going to look at the standardized prices in, in the second slide. So we'll look at it both ways for each slide. So for um, Vermont inpatient services, first of all, notice this is just 2022. So we tried to chart just the most recent year of claims data. And that's different than some of the other data we showed uh, in the report or in the Excel file. Sometimes we're able to publish three years of claims data combined, the 2020 through 2022 time period. Um, we do that at the hospital level just to make sure we have enough claims data for each hospital. But at the system level, we're able to publish relative prices and standardized prices one year at a time. So yeah, this chart is just 2022 uh, ranking um, the systems by relative price top to bottom for inpatient only. So if you switch to standardized price, which again removes that part of the Medicare payment system denominator from this equation, and again, we're looking at the same thing, inpatient services only, 2022 only. So if you look at just the standardized prices, um, the ranking uh, looks like this, and, and you can see the axis label is no longer percent of Medicare. It's the average allowed amount dollars per standardized inpatient service. So now we'll switch to outpatient services. Um, for outpatient services, the relative price um, is, is shown here with highest to lowest. And you'll notice for outpatient services, I think there's a little bit more significant change when we switch this chart to standardized prices. Let's go ahead and look at the standardized prices next for outpatient. The ranking here has changed a bit. And again, that kind of reveals that for outpatient services, at least, um, the Medicare payment system uh, may be influencing the relative price calculations for some uh, systems. And again, this is dollars per standardized outpatient service. One interesting uh, example of that change is look at how the independent critical access hospitals jumped up to not the least expensive anymore, but the second least expensive, relatively speaking, when you use standardized price. But when I jump back to the other slide with relative price, the independent critical access hospitals were the least expensive. And so presumably that was because Medicare payments for critical access hospitals are higher. So when Medicare is the denominator of this, um, this percent uh, result, it makes their percent of Medicare look lower, more towards 150% of Medicare. But when you look at the standardized price, that extra Medicare payment is not relevant. And now Quorum Health Corporation looks uh, a little less expensive than the CACs. So I think this is the last slide. You know, how can employers and policymakers again use this price transparency? Finally, the information about prices is at your fingertips, ready to um, easily compare one hospital to another, one state to another. You can benchmark more easily. And some, um, some purchasers have used this data to negotiate better prices when they feel uh, that that's appropriate or change their hospital networks um, and take action. Um, and I'll pause now for, for questions. Thank you. Um, I'll open up to the board members and then we'll take 
and the healthcare advocate will do public comment after all the presentations. Any board member questions or comments? I had just a couple more technical questions. Um, do you happen to know, or could you let us know later, the percentage of the self-insured market data that you have from Vermont? Um, I could, I mean, the easiest way to estimate it, I, I imagine others on this call are probably have a better um, estimate of how big the self-insured market is in Vermont. I would have to do some research to to find out the, the total. And then we've published how much data we have. So if you if you know the dollar amount that was spent on uh, on commercial claims, hospital claims in Vermont, and you just divide what we published of, of the dollar amount we've analyzed, you know, you could you could get that percentage. I'm guessing if I had to guess, um, well, I'm not going to guess, but, you know, we have the APCD data, which is just a ton of data. Yeah, it's so, missing about half of the self-insured data. Great. So then we fill in a lot of that self-insured data um, by recruiting a few of the national employers, large employers. So we're able to supplement the APCD with some of that. But still, the majority of our, our claims data is going to be from the APCD. Okay, thanks. That just gives me a ballpark. Um, okay. And then do you, and you, this may not be something that you know, but um, for the Medicare data that you use for the percentages, does is that just claims data or would it include, for example, the all-inclusive population-based payments that many of our hospitals receive under our current agreement, which is typically not included in the claims data? So the claims data is going to show us the commercial payment Yep. Right. I think your question is related to the Medicare payment, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, so we're um, uh, estimating the Medicare payment. Uh, Got it. Uh, based, you know, it's sometimes we refer to it as a synthesized uh, payment. You know, um, it's it's putting the same claim through the Medicare price grouper and pricer. Um, and then it spits out what Medicare would have paid. So I believe that includes all the adjustments that Medicare normally makes when they make a payment. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Brian, and uh, thank you for coming to present to us. This is Tom Walsh. Um, I had a question regarding the market share that you um, slide that you showed where the variation in commercial price was um, about 18% of that variation was explained by market power. And I was wondering if there were, was a variable in your model with a larger coefficient than 18%. I don't believe, um, I, I don't have the answer to that, definitely, not, not at my fingertips. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure if I consult with Chris Whaley and, and the statistician who who ran that calculation. I'm not sure they would have that either, but I could get back to you. Okay, thanks. Um, and then I was interested in um, the change between um, relative pricing and standardized pricing, how it um, sometimes changed the rank order of the of the hospitals and trying to get my head around that um so on one of the last slides for example i i think it was outpatient pricing our larger hospital dropped from near the top with relative pricing to third or fourth with standardized pricing and if i understood your commentary through that um that would that could be because aspects of Medicare payments are removed for the standardized pricing, which would then tell me, if I'm thinking this through out loud with you, that when you add back in the, um, the academic medical center um, bump that Medicare provides, the rurality bump that Medicare provides, 
Um, when you add those back in, it inflates the Medicare reimbursement. Um, so I'm I'm trying to trying to make sure I've got my head around this because this slide makes me think that the health network is getting quite a large bump to their Medicare payments. Or have I flipped that around? I could be thinking of it. Yeah, so, so um, if we're looking at relative rank. Mm -hmm. The next, you know, the prior slide. Which is, well, well, all of them are showing systems relative to each other. Right, they're all mm -hmm. they're all listing the systems and comparing the systems with each other. So, relatively speaking, um, this slide is basically blind to what Medicare is paying them. You know, it's like, what if you imagine you didn't care what Medicare was paying them? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you just said that's irrelevant. I don't care what they're saying. This just looks at their commercial payments and says which one is getting relatively more higher commercial payments for outpatient and which one is getting relatively lower commercial payments for outpatient. Um, the other slide, I'll put it up, puts those Medicare payments into the equation. This is the only slide where Medicare's, the, the one you referenced, the payment you referenced, gets into the equation. So this slide might be more appropriate to look at if you actually wanted that to be in your thinking. You know, like, I want to know if Medicare's paying them a lot, maybe if they're paying them a lot, then it's reasonable for, me to, you know, maybe, maybe that's the cost shifting mentality, right? That's like, I'm going to pay you higher or lower based on whether you're getting paid higher or lower by Medicare. That's, that's the cost shifting kind of point of view. But if you don't buy cost shifting or think that's the way to, you know, think about it, you look at this slide and you say, I don't care what Medicare is doing. This is what commercial pairs are doing. Thank you. That helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Can, can I just stick on this slide for one quick second? And so are these weighted within the system? And are these all, and with Dartmouth-Hitchcock there, is that, are these just the Vermont hospitals within their systems or are these? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's the so, Dartmouth-Hitchcock or the Vermont Dartmouth-Hitchcock hospitals, but not yes. including the New Hampshire Dartmouth-Hitchcock hospitals. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. And with mm -hmm. the University of Vermont network, are these these are the Vermont UVM hospitals, not including the New York UVM hospitals? And I'm sorry, I interrupted before the waiting question. Are these weighted? So, um, the calculation is going to reflect whatever claims actually occurred in 2022. So, in that sense, it's going to reflect reality. You know, not not just trying to wait all the types of possible claims, including claims that never even happen, you know, it's not going to, it's going to give them a zero weight because they never happened. And if, if a lot of babies were born, for example, in, in um, one hospital, it's going to, it's going to reflect the commercial prices for maternity if there's more babies born, but then it's going to translate them into a standardized unit of out, well, this is outpatient. I shouldn't have used babies as an example, but, um, but yeah, it's it's weighted in the sense that it's reflecting what claims actually happened that year. Okay. So so this isn't this isn't the uh, standardized price of say for UVM the three Vermont hospitals, you know, added up and divided by three. This is the claims experience right. of those three Vermont hospitals. Okay. That is correct. That is correct. Mm -hmm. So. Is there, an, are there any issues with say comparing, let's say right at the top here, we have UVM Health Network, which includes three hospitals and there's a very large system in Vermont and North Country, 
which is very small, provides very different services. You know, UVM has cardiothoracic surgery, they've got intensive care, they've got cath labs and oncology services. North Country is a small critical access hospital with much far fewer services. Can I compare the standardized prices between these two? And if so, how, or if, if not, why? Yeah, so the standardized price, you know, Medicare's attempt to translate a different, um, different services into a standardized unit of service. To the extent that you believe that's been done right, it is allowing you to compare a totally different menu of services to, you know, the other hospital's menu of services. If, you know, and that's all published by Medicare, you know, you could look at their standardized weights and you could say to yourself, I don't think Medicare has has sufficiently um, adjusted for the way that these claims are different, the way these services are different. Or if you do believe Medicare has done the correct adjustment, then you then you would say this is a fair apples to apples comparison. So the adjustment. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't understand. I clearly don't understand this in the in sort of the level of resolution and detail as you do. But so it's, it's my understanding that the adjustment is based upon um, the services provided and the relative weights within the Medicare system of the sort of unit value of those services. Is that a, a fair? Yeah, summary? I mean, basically. You know, they've they've got a full list of services and levels of severity. They've assigned a weight to each one and published that. And so they're trying to translate between a visit for chest pains and a visit to, you know, inspect your your cough. And, you know, these are two different services, two different types of visit that cost different amounts and, and get get paid different amounts. But Medicare has given one of them 10 units of service and the other five units of service. So they've tried to translate so that after you use this Medicare translation factor, this weight, you're comparing the same units of service, of standardized outpatient service. Okay. Yeah. Can I, so can I just give an example and uh, just, I'm sorry to take everyone's time on this, but I'm truly really trying to like and make sure I get this right. But say one hospital is outpatient cardiac cath procedures and they do a whole lot of them and they charge $1,000 for abdominal CT. And another hospital does no cardiac cath procedures and a lot of coughs and they charge $1,000 for an outpatient abdominal CT. Should their relative prices end up being the same because of, well, I guess it all depends on what they charge for cardiac catheterizations and the cough. But yeah, you divide you divide the allowed amount by the unit of standardized services that Medicare has published for those two different, you know, types of things. Let me, let, let me just ask you this. Um, does the if a hospital provides more high intensity complex services in the outpatient setting, should that drive up their relative sta their standardized outpatient price it, just by the just by the intensity of the by the um, the acuity the high uh, the high value of those services, or is that that's all divided out through the unit based system through the Medicare approach? Yeah, it's supposed to be divided out. Okay. I mean, obviously, it's a daunting task for Medicare <laughs> to try to get the correct weights right. for everything, every possibility on earth. But um, at least it has the beauty of being public. Medicare's published it. They published their methods. And that's the best uh, you could probably do to make it an apples to apples comparison. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. 
Right, I just have a quick question. Um, well, first, a thanks um, for all of the hard work that you and your teams do every year to compile all this information for, for folks. Really, really appreciate it. It's always interesting to look at and, and to think about what it means for us in Vermont. I'm just actually just curious, um, assuming you get funding to continue this work, anything that you can foreshadow about RAND 6.0, you know, the, the chart that you gave us, the timeline of the additions each year, I'm just wondering what's next for, for this work? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, we we don't have a confirmation yet um, of, of a sixth round. Um, in the past rounds, we've been funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and in the past, we've always, publish them every two years. So um, it's a pretty long lead time. You know, that would mean May of 2026 uh, would would be the next round if it happened. And then um, it would cover years 2022 through 2024. So it would overlap one year with this round. That's That's been our tradition, at least. So I could tell you that you know that's a model that could continue if if we got funding and all that and um besides that we just try to improve every round we try to have more data more claims data and we try to do you know more analysis um in in ways that we haven't been able to do in the previous rounds so we try to build each time well maybe we'll brainstorm here and see what we would love to see in Iran 6.0 <laughs> we'll send yeah, it yeah, ideas well, your way yeah open thank you to Open to suggestions. Thank you. Um, Brian, I had one question. One, a huge plug for RAN 6.0. This is very important data to regulators and the public. So um, if I had anyone I could lean on at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I, I would, but I don't have such people. Um, the movement, Vermont is a higher on outpatient, and it looks as though we've been increasing on our outpatient uh, relative price, and our inpatient is not. Do you have any suppositions as to why that is or what could be driving that? I do not. Um, I don't have much Vermont specific research under my belt. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Um, I don't think I had any other questions, but thank you for taking the time to come today and to share your insights with us. They're very valuable to the state. Thank you. Agreed. Um, Ms. Barby, would you like to introduce the next speakers? Yes. All right. So next we'll be hearing from John Bartholomew and Tom Nash. Um, both are independent contractors that contracted with um, the Green Mountain Care Board um, to produce this report, which is based on their methodology that they've um, shared with other states and um, worked with in Colorado. Um, would you guys like to introduce yourselves a little bit more in your background and then dive in? We are excited to hear from you. Sure thing. Um, uh, first of all, I uh, testing the sharing screen. Did that come up? Okay. Great. And is size okay and all that? Okay. Great. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, my name is John Bartholomew. I am a contractor uh, working with my uh, partner, Tom Nash. Uh, my uh, background, um, I spent uh, 22 years at Colorado Medicaid. Um, the last 12 years of that uh, tenure was uh, as their chief financial officer. Over this period of time, uh, we implemented a hospital provider tax um, and we expanded Medicaid. We expected to see some things in the commercial market. Uh, we expected to see commercial premium trends um, kind of decrease uh, or, or the trend of increase decrease in, in terms. Uh, so in other words, uh, we, we expected to see commercial prices increase at a slower trend. And what we saw was the exact opposite. In fact, we saw a near doubling of commercial premiums over the time frame of in, uh, in implementing higher payments in Medicaid using the federal hospital provider tax mechanism and expanding Medicaid, which uh, cut our uninsured rate nearly into a third, um, decreasing 
uh, charity care and bad debt at hospitals by over 60%. Um, so those two big impacts, we had these expectations and they just did not come out. Um, uh, the, that started some work in Colorado and that's when Tom and I started working together on um, the analysis that you'll see today. Uh, we're really excited to present it. I've been retired from the state for three years now and um, just doing some consulting uh, on the side as I am semi-retired. Uh, Tom? Hi, my name is uh, Tom Nashford. We really uh, appreciate the opportunity to present to you all today. Um, I uh, spent about 12 years, uh, after, after a career in, in public accounting, I spent about 12 years in uh, with a, a large hospital system in Colorado, Centura Health. Um, from there, I went to uh, work for the Colorado Hospital Association, was the vice president of financial policy and, and CFO for that organization. Uh, I had my first uh, failed attempt at a retirement in, in 2013, uh, and uh, but have uh, remained involved and have been doing consulting ever since. All right, so let me just figure out how to change slides here. Uh, so thanks again for having us uh, today. We're excited to share with you uh, some of our analysis. Um, we're going to review a few things. We're uh, going to focus a lot on this uh, three-prong approach that uh, Tom and I use um, using Medicare cost report data. And um, we'll show you the hospitals we've analyzed. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, at the back of this slide deck is a whole bunch of uh, uh, detail and about some of the adjustments and uh, information we use. Um, I'd like to welcome board members to interrupt us if questions come up, if there's some clarifying technical questions that you might have uh, during the presentation, please just raise your hand or uh, get my attention somehow um, and uh, we'll get those questions answered. We're going to go through a lot of data, so uh, uh, something you're very much aware of that uh, just recently, a few months ago, you established a three and a half percent uh, net patient revenue cap and we we're using that as kind of a, a benchmark in, in a way uh, as we look at uh, some of the vermont hospitals net patient revenue uh, we started with a couple of goals that we worked out with uh, uh, green mountain care board staff um, how does the vermont hospital industry compare to national peers on cost price and margins and then can we identify vermont hospitals that appear to be outliers um, on cost, price, and profit. And uh, with those two goals in mind, uh, we're gonna get into how we uh, go about doing that. As I mentioned, <clears throat> we have a three-prong approach. So our first kind of set of analyses is uh, taking Vermont hospitals and finding peers. Think hospitals that look like them across a couple of uh, four actually categories. Um, we then also use a different set of analyses to look at um, how Medicare pays uh, and what the Medicare costs are of that hospital. This is a great cost efficiency measure. If you have about 1.0 in this measure, you're breaking even on Medicare payments. We have a lot of information from uh, the MedPAC report that just came out in March in 2024 that says a, an efficient hospital should be at about 97% of where uh, uh, in this ratio. So payments to cost should equal about 97% or an efficiently run hospital should only lose about 3%. And then lastly, we're gonna look at just hospital data, cost and revenue trends, uh, we're going to use whole dollars and uh, divide it by uh, an adjusted discharge measure. We think these uh, these three sets of analyses provide a lot of extra insights uh, to you folks and other healthcare administrators, and it it'll, it allows you to kind of triangulate the findings from the three sets of analyses. Um, so let's get into it. Um, we started with uh, 16 hospitals. Um, we removed uh, psychiatric and critical access hospitals for the first two steps of this analysis. Um, and that is because their size uh, doesn't really um, work out too well with our metrics that we use in comparing hospitals and their peers. Um, and also um, the Medicare payment to cost ratio is 
since hospital uh, critical access hospitals by definition um, get paid costs, those all have the same value at about uh, 1.0. Um, so we ended up with six uh, of your big hospital, uh, six of your big Vermont hospitals, and they are uh, they capture about four fifths of your market. About 80% of your discharges, or 81% of the hospital net patient revenue in your state. And that's using uh, 2022 data. In the peer group uh, comparisons, that first step, um, we found four hospitals, or about a quarter of your market share, were uh, high price as compared to their peers across the country. We do a lot of adjustments to make these comparisons. Uh, similar. We'll get into some of those. Um, uh, when we looked at cost, five out of the six, or about three quarters of your market share, uh, turned into an outlier uh, and in terms of cost. These are what we would call high cost hospitals. Um, and then uh, one hospital actually was high in both uh, cost and price, but also uh, profit as well. Um, and they are about a 10% market share, that one hospital. So how do we find peers? Um, it's not easy to compare one hospital to another, but I think it's very necessary for us to do that. Um, so we look at bed size, of course. Uh, it's an easy, easy comparator. We also want to look at the acuity level that that hospital generally sees. Uh, sometimes location of a hospital could influence the uh, acuity or the level of sickness or disease in that region. Um, we also look at teaching intensity. Um, as we heard in the prior uh, presentation, and as I'm sure some of you are aware that, you know, if you're a teaching hospital, you may have higher costs. So we have a teaching intensity uh, measure that we use to compare, uh, uh, to find a peer. Uh, we also look at service intensity. Intensive care costs can vary quite a bit. We heard a little bit of that in the prior uh, presentation as well. So we um, compare intensive care costs at a facility and look for similarities across the country. Our data sets uh, nearly 4,000 hospitals similar to uh, RAND. And, um, and we are trying to achieve a peer group size of between five and 20 hospitals. Um, Sometimes we may have to increase or lower um, the, uh, the, the, the methods or these metrics to get to five or to limit to 20. Um, and here's how they uh, break down. Uh, our six big hospitals in Vermont listed here, as you're well aware. Um, Q1 or the first quartile is kind of the lowest measure. So if uh, we look at Brattleboro, their Medicare case mix quartile, they fell in the second quartile, almost in the middle. Um, they don't have a residence, so they don't have a teaching uh, a teaching metric. Uh, so we'll be comparing them to other hospitals that don't also don't have teaching. Intensive care costs, uh, quite low for Brattleboro. They're in the first quartile. And we found <clears throat> 19 peers across the country. A list of each peer for each of these six um, is available. Uh, it's not in this slide deck, but I'm not going to focus too much on the other hospitals. But um, as you can see, going through the list, um, we have about between seven or 19 hospitals in each peer group uh, for the uh, six Vermont hospitals. Of course, the university is up in the top tier for teaching, uh, uh, fourth quarter quartile. However, their intensive care costs are, are in the first quartile. Okay, so looking at price and cost, we have a lot going on in this slide, but we've wanted to put it into a quadrant uh, mapping cost on the x-axis or horizontal axis and price on the vertical axis. The big solid black lines are basically 100% the median of the peer group. So each of these six Vermont hospitals have a different peer group, and we've um, uh, essentially mapped out the median uh, of the peer group and, and benchmarked it to 100%, and uh, mapped out the Vermont hospitals in comparison on cost, 
adjusted for wage index and cost of living. So kind of a regional, uh, ge uh, regional or geographic uh, adjustment, and then mapped it out according to price based on acuity. So uh, price is adjusted with a CMI that comes, uh, the case mix in index that comes from uh, Medicare. And we can see, um, for example, Southwestern is, and the dash lines, I'm sorry, I should point out, the dash lines kind of portray 10% uh, uh, plus or minus the median of the peer group. So if we look at Southwestern uh, Vermont Medical Center, they fall within the 10% of both cost and price and are not an outlier versus University uh, of Vermont Medical Center. They are within the normal range or uh, within the 10% plus or minus on price, but they are an outlier on cost. And as you can see, we had five cost outliers, um, university being one of the lower price. Uh, in fact, it's not an outlier, but the other four hospitals are all outliers. And that's what that third quadrant or the quadrant labeled uh, in red. Um, this is where uh, hospitals, uh, this, is not the, this is not a good quadrant to be in. Um, we like to see kind of a, a distribution of some hospitals maybe in quadrant one. Uh, but what we have in Vermont is most of the hospitals fall into quadrant three, if, if just barely, uh, but there are four of the six that are definitely outliers in price and cost as we saw on the previous slide. Looking at that data in a little bit differently, we have kind of um, taken price and what we call price per patient. And there is some detail on how we calculate that, but it's essentially net patient revenue divided by adjusted discharges. Uh, it's a common metric in combining a hospitals inpatient and outpatient uh, business uh, size of business. And we have a couple of sets of information here. We have the unadjusted um, information. So just straight out of the cost report, net patient revenue uh, divided by adjusted discharge. But then as we saw, we do adjust the data when we're looking for peers and comparing it to others. So then we have the price per patient adjusted for case mix as compared to the median of the peer group and then a percentage difference. And as we saw, uh, Southwestern and University were very close in price uh, to the peer median. And you can see Southwestern was about 2% higher than the peer median and University of Vermont 1% higher. But we have several hospitals, for example, Brattleboro and Central Vermont, um, you know, greater than 150% of the peer median and uh, central Vermont being quite a bit higher at 170% of the peer group median. We have a similar slide on cost. And again, unadjusted costs so is just straight out of the Medicare cost report. Um, we use a hospital only cost metric. So cost report could include a whole lot of information uh, from non-hospital business that the hospital does we limit, uh, just like net patient revenue is revenue from a hospital's business of serving patients, hospital only costs are just the hospital costs of providing, rendering hospital services. Um, then we have the data that is adjusted so that we can compare to the peer, uh, peer groups and we have the peer group median. Here we have on the right, the uh, percent exceeding that group. So, Basically, we've plotted these six hospitals in that uh, two-dimension two graph with uh, the quadrants of pricing uh, cost. Um, and here we're you know, looking at University Hospital, one of the bigger hospitals, the, the biggest hospital in Vermont, 22% uh, higher than the peer group median in its uh, cost category. Um, all the way up to uh, Brattleboro at 155% uh, of the peer group median median. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we can look at this data one more way. Uh, we can kind of cascade it down. And I, I, here we have the six hospitals, uh, four are high price, two normal price, four are high cost um, that are high price, all four of those. One of the normal price hospitals is also high cost. And we can see here, um, 
one of the high price hospitals and high cost hospitals is also a high profit hospital. And that is uh, Central Vermont Hospital. Um, several hospitals had low profits and uh, one of the high price, high cost hospitals had normal profits. Um, and you can see the five hospitals comprising about three quarters of the state volume are all captured in that high cost category. That is the first set of analyses. Um, so what we'd like to do is kind of, all right, sh shift a little bit and look at another metric to see, well, what, what does this other piece of information uh, tell us? And that is the Medicare payment to cost ratio. Extracting information out of the Medicare cost report, we're able to take a hospital's Medicare payments and their costs allocated to Medicare and create this metric uh, or ratio. It's simply payments divided by cost. If it's 1.0, payments equal cost, then you're breaking even on Medicare. And according to the MedPAC 2024 report using data through 2022, they find 97% uh, to be the threshold of where an efficient hospital should be. When we look at the median of the six large Vermont hospitals, it's quite a bit lower. It is uh, at 73%. Let's look at that over time. Um, this is what I found interesting, uh, is that the median of these six hospitals back in 2011 was 0.9 or 90%. In other words, back in 2011, these six hospitals in aggregate were um, only losing about 10% on Medicare. And by 2022, that median of the six hospitals dropped to 73%. So they're now losing 27% on Medicare. Medicare does its best to fund hospitals so that its Medicare beneficiaries have access. And, and to meet the costs of efficiently run hospitals. So one can only surmise that possibly costs are increasing at a rate greater than Medicare is reimbursing. And that could also point us to something that we might want to study further. Um, this next slide shows the actual Medicare payment to cost ratio number of each of the six hospitals, but it also has the median of the peer group. And what jumps out to me is how low the Vermont hospital metrics are. In fact, University of Vermont, which is nearly half of your market share, about 48% of your uh, patient revenue, is 72%. Whereas its peer group median, they're actually making money on Medicare. In fact, uh, the peer group had about uh, seven or eight hospitals in it. Um, and most of them were 95% or higher. I think uh, seven of the eight other hospitals in its peer group are doing quite well on Medicare uh, payments. Um, let's see, yeah, go on to the next slide here. Here's a little conclusion of that finding. And that is that back in 2011, the median of the six hospitals was at 90%. Medicare payment to cost ratio for the two University of Vermont Medical Center uh, or the, the system, the, the, the medical University of Vermont Medical Center and Central Vermont Hospital, um, they were over 90% back in 2011. And now they are 77% and 72%. Uh, uh, first one was uh, Central Vermont. Um, this is a pretty steep decline over this 11 year period of time. The third prong of our analysis is just reviewing revenue and uh, cost data. Um, individual hospital data we wanted to compare, we compare it to um, the state uh, median as well as a national median. And we're gonna get to that, but I wanted to just point out a couple of other interesting things, um, things you're probably very much aware of, but um, interestingly, of course, you're probably aware the uh, population jumped up a little bit uh, during COVID um, and then has since leveled off uh, through 2022. It seems to be kind of leveled off with 21. But that increase of population only increased 
adjusted discharges, which is graphed uh, on the right axis, uh, just a little bit. Um, and in aggregate, between 2012 and 2022, over this 10-year period of time, the, um, the, the adjusted discharge growth rate is actually negative, um, almost a negative 1% trend year over year. But you do see just a little bit of an uptick in the most recent two years. That's probably having to do with uh, the population growing by about 30, 40,000 uh, folks uh, during 2020 and 2021. Here we have just kind of adjusted discharges per thousand uh, Vermonters. Um, and yeah, what we saw in the last slide, we could kind of see individually at each of these hospitals that it's more or less a negative trend across um, uh, th these years. Uh, looks like only Rutland had a pretty sizable increase in volume, uh, but also central Vermont saw some increase in volume and Southwestern. And that little table on the bottom shows just a simple percent change of uh, 2022 over 2020, I'm sorry, 2012. Um, now, uh, we talked a little bit about market share. Here's how um, these, using 2022 data, here's how we're looking at market share using a net patient revenue or a hospital's percent of total net patient revenue. So we have about 81% for the big six, and we've got the eight critical access hospitals comprising uh, about uh, 19%. So here we got a lot of data here. So let me explain what we're looking at. We're looking at trends of cost and price, whole dollars, but also cost and price divided by uh, adjusted discharge, which we call a per adjusted discharge or PAD. So in the first column of data, um, we have uh, the 11 year um, trend model. And then in the next column next to it, it's uh, the five year trend model. So uh, the first column is uh, 11 years uh, and, and the top left box shows national, all the national hospitals in our data set, and then the Vermont six hospitals, not in, uh, so no critical access hospitals there. Um, the, the next column of data uh, shows also whole dollar for the shorter trend line. And then we have cost um, up in the upper tier, um, uh, whole dollar uh, cost and, and CAGR or uh, compound annual growth rate is the trend uh, formula we use to calculate an annual trend. And then we have a cost trend of the shorter time frame, uh, the most recent five years of data. So the shading um, just is a simple comparison, Vermont as compared to the nation's trends. You can see in green on the top tier, we have um, hospitals uh, have a lower trend in net patient revenue whole dollars, but they have a higher trend than the nation in whole dollar um, costs. And these costs are the same costs we've talked about before, these hospital only uh, costs is a little legend down at the bottom of our acronyms. There's lots of acronyms on this slide. In the middle tier, we have the whole dollars for the big six hospitals divided by adjusted discharges. Uh, we've done that for the nation as well. And in green uh, are the Vermont trends for net patient revenue, both the longer trend and the shorter time frame, shorter uh, time frame trend, uh, not exceeding or, or under or below uh, the national trend, yet in cost, you are exceeding the national trend. Looking at critical access hospitals on the very bottom, since the per adjusted discharge metric doesn't quite work very well for small hospitals, we uh, just look at whole dollars. So we only have the one uh, set of analyses on trends for Vermont's critical access hospitals. These are those eight hospitals we talked about, and in large part, uh, they are underneath or lower than the national trend, except for the short period or five-year whole dollar cost trend, uh, the lower right trend where uh, critical access hospitals in aggregate are growing at 6.9% versus the nation. This is a high-level uh, review, uh, high-level high look to see how your hospitals in aggregate are comparing. We're going to get into the detail in just a minute. 
uh, looking at the individual Vermont hospitals. But we wanted to look at some things over time as well. And uh, so this is looking at net patient revenue. And on the left axis, we have national numbers, national NPR, and those numbers get quite big into the trillion uh, figure. On the right is Vermont's uh, net patient revenue. You can kind of see the graphs are similar. There's a dip obviously in 2020 for the nation as well as Vermont and an increase since 2020 uh, for both the nation and Vermont. A little bit steeper of a curve for Vermont. And then we have compound annual growth rates in the bottom here where Vermont is actually not growing at the same rate as the nation. So this is a good sign. Let's look at cost. So same set of information, except this is all cost. The left is the nation cost and the right uh, axis uh, is the uh, Vermont costs. And here the lines do look quite similar, um, an uptick since 2020. However, the cost trends in Vermont are steeper. The, the rates are growing a little bit faster than the nation, uh, nearly a percent more than the nation in the short 2018 to 2022 timeframe. This probably will put pressure on hitting a revenue, uh, a net patient revenue cap. Um, but let's uh, get into the specifics of the data. So we are looking at two sets of trends, an 11 year trend, a five year trend, and we've done the analysis on all six hospitals, of the, 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 the larger six hospitals. And we look at both whole dollars and per adjusted discharge for the eight critical excess hospitals, we'll just look at the whole dollar amounts. So here, the first slide is um, whole dollar analysis for 11 year and five year. And um, these compound annual growth rates, the ones that are highlighted in yellow, they exceed the state uh, trend. So this is the basically the aggregate or the uh, median, uh, uh, actually it's an average uh, of the six hospitals. And then the na national trend is in there uh, just for informational purposes. You'll see central Vermont, for example, exceeds every trend um, or exceeds, or every set of analysis exceeds the state trend. Um, and university um, exceeds the state trend in three of those categories and uh, Rutland exceeds just in the one. Uh, these are whole dollar trends. And this slide is very similar, but this is per adjusted discharge trends. So here, University Hospital does exceed the state trend in each of the um, categories, as well as Brattleboro. Central Vermont exceeds in uh, the revenue per adjusted discharge or price per patient, sometimes we call it. Um, but not in cost. Um, and here's a little table on just whole dollars for the critical access hospitals. Um, yellow, once again, uh, denotes exceeding the state trend. Quite a few of the uh, critical access hospitals exceed the state trend in cost and revenue. Um, You'll see, and uh, let's see, I guess we have uh, one in every category, a couple in every category, and uh, Porter hitting in uh, three of the categories that we looked at, um, but both cost categories. And to summarize the findings, five of the six large hospitals appeared to be an outlier in cost when compared to their peers. That's when costs are adjusted to make comparisons across the country. Four of those five also had higher price. In looking at the Medicare data, um, using this payment to cost ratio, where 97% is what MedPAC says is what an efficient hospital should be at, we found uh, the median of the Vermont hospitals to be quite a bit lower at 73%. And all six of the large Vermont hospitals um, were well below, <clears throat> excuse me, well below their peers, their peer group medians. Um, and then in our trend analysis, we found uh, the University of Vermont Health Network, which is about 60% of your market, um, 
that they exceeded uh, both the peer group and statewide trends in most categories. And we come up with this conclusion that uh, hospital efficiency uh, is a key factor in limiting healthcare cost growth um, and meeting your Green Mountain Care Board revenue growth cap may be in jeopardy if your hospital price and cost trends uh, exceed that targeted increase. So uh, that is our presentation. The, the last several slides uh, include a lot of uh, detail about our adjustments, and I believe there's a written report also available uh, for you if you'd like. So we can see if there's any questions on our presentation. We are very happy to do this for you. Great, thank you. Thank you both for coming and for the presentation. That was really insightful. Um, I'll open up to the other board members for any questions or comments. Can I ask a question about CVMC? You mentioned, could you go back to explaining the high profit? Yes, so um, that was, as compared to its peers, um, let's see. And and since this is yeah. the, since this is Medicare cost report, this is for Medicare. Uh, the, the profit numbers actually are for the hospital overall, all, all payer. Okay. Um, a lot of times we can reconcile the cost report to maybe audited financial statements that the hospital produces. Uh, not always, um, you know, a lot of times there may be differences between the entities that are included in an audit of financial statements versus what goes on the cost report. But the margin numbers that we, um, uh, that we pull from the cost report are, are all there. Uh, and are, total is it to total margin or operating margin? We, the, the Medicare cost report has two margin um, okay. metrics. One is called a patient services margin which is uh, net patient revenue, uh, the excess of net patient revenue, excess or deficiency of net patient revenue over total operating costs. And then they have a total margin uh, where you're, you're adding in your non-operating uh, costs and possible revenue sources um, uh, to, to get to a bottom line or, or net income type margin. Uh, we like to look at the patient services margin number. I think what's confusing me is in all of our reports, we have CVMC losing money overall. Um, so I am just having a little trouble understanding sort of the distinction between what we normally see and and this. Yeah, what um, the high profit may be, you know, kind of a misnomer. It, it, again, this is a comparison to their peers. It, you know, it may very well be that they're just not losing as much as <laughs> their peers. Okay, uh, got it. Uh, you know, that, that may be the reason. Okay, thank you. That that would help reconcile it in my mind. Thank you so much. Yeah. John, Tom, this is Tom Walsh. Um, thank you for coming today and thank you for all of the work you've done. Um, I was intrigued by kind of your origin story, John, of um, expecting that commercial price growth would slow as Medicare reimbursement rose to hospitals in Colorado and then not not seeing that. I just um, that aligns with the RAND evidence that was presented earlier with uh, where they don't see cost shifting in the traditional sense in their data. Um, we have but we have hospitals in our state who claim that they they do need to cost shift. Um, and so I'm wondering with your consulting experience and regulatory experience, um, what are your thoughts or experience on dealing with hospitals who say no, we we need to charge these higher commercial prices um, because of the number of uh, patients we see who have Medicare and Medicaid? Yeah, I think uh, well, I'll start. But uh, Tom Nash, if you could um, uh, just pick up uh, <laughs> where I leave off. But um, I, I think you know I've seen evidence, and it was a Medicaid reimbursement that we increased in Colorado, 
<clears throat> and now in Colorado, Medicaid reimburses hospitals more than Medicare, um, yet we still see pretty significant commercial healthcare premium trends. Um, certainly uh, in that time period after the expansion of Medicaid and those reimbursements uh, started flowing every year uh, from Medicaid. Um, but, you know, hospitals, I think, <laughs> that say that are not um, grappling with what's happening in the country. <laughs> uh, healthcare costs in, in the country are uh, very high and they're rising faster than wages. Um, and that trend is not sustainable. And I think hospitals who claim that they need higher payments from the commercial sector to offset government payers need to review their own costs center trends and they need to use data from this type of analysis or their cost reports uh, to see how they compare uh, to their peers. How do they compare to Medicare? They need to review their own cost trends to see where cost inefficient uh, cost efficiencies can occur or where they have their own cost inefficiencies that they can remedy. Um, I think seeking remedy, uh, I think seeking revenue to offset their claimed losses from the governor, government sector uh, reimbursement levels has uh, been proven to not only be an ineffective mechanism um, for creating a sustainable uh, financial plan, but also exacerbates both affordability and sustainability problems, and it increases costs higher. So I, I don't think it's the remedy. Uh, I think costs in a hospital needs to review its own costs especially if they have a Medicare payment to cost ratio that is, you know, quite low, uh, like we saw for University of Vermont, one of your biggest hospitals, half a year market. Um, Tom Nash, just add on a little. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the, the, the argument is that, you know, we need more money because uh, you're not covering our cost kind of um, masks. Uh, actually brings to light the notion that uh, hospitals believe that they're, they're or would like policymakers to believe their operating costs are what they are um, and, and and kind of uh, nothing can be nothing can be done uh, about them however we know from just the simple Medicare payment to cost ratio that some hospitals do matter do better on on Medicare payments than others now, granted, that's that's just the Medicare portion of their business. But if they're they're efficient on Medicare, and are able to get close to break even on Medicare, then it's likely they're efficient on uh, across all payers. Um, you know, research has shown that that um, uh, cost shift is not uh, necessarily a big a, a, a big driver so much as as, as market power. Hospitals with uh, a lot of commercial business or a lot of influence. A lot of uh, leverage on on negotiating commercial rates uh, will much more uh, do that use that leverage to increase the revenue side um, rather than uh, to uh, cut money out of the out of the cost side. So, um, and I think what what happened in Colorado is a, is a good example of that. Um, uh, Medicaid did increase their payments to hospitals. Um, all that did was to serve, uh, or was to allow the hospitals to increase their cost structures. We saw we saw their cost structures grow up. We did not see uh, commercial um, commercial rates come down. We did not see a, a squeezing on the uh, the commercial side um, to reflect an increase in the Medicaid payment. So uh, obviously the hospitals in Colorado got more Medicaid payment, and then they also exerted their influence and their leverage in the commercial market to uh, continue to uh, get. Um, uh, price increases there as well. well thank you for um, you know, kind of outlining your experience and the data. Some of your, well, all of your slides that talked about cost um, had some of our hospitals rated as high cost. And I, I wanted to unpack that a little bit if I could for my own thinking. Um, if a hospital has um, higher paid nurses or higher paid doctors, that would show up in the higher cost, right? Mm -hmm. um, how about if it, if it had a larger number of administrators compared to their peers, would that make it a high cost? Certainly, certainly administrative costs are, are in there. 
you know, in our in our Medicare payment to cost ratio, or even our hospital only costs metric, uh, if they are considered an allowable cost by by Medicare, they're in there. And that most administrative costs, a lot of administrative costs are. And and so if a if an organization had market power and rose its prices and then used those the revenue from those prices to expand its administrative um, roles and salaries that would show up as higher costs mm -hmm. and then those organizations could say because our costs are high we and medicare has not paid us more we need more commercial money yeah yeah, yeah. You, so you, it's, a, it, it's a cycle yeah you've just described an interesting graphic that, that i think uh colorado uh, department of healthcare policy and financing put together that's kind of this in infinity loop showing exactly what you just described it, it just keeps spiraling and the 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 high um the growing costs driving higher requests from commercial payments it's not that the higher commercial payments are needed as much as the request is a result of having market power and prior decisions to expand. Yeah, it, it appears that it appears that way, and I think and I think as long as that dynamic exists, uh, again we go back to this Medicare payment to cost ratio. It's likely that that ratio is going to continue to drop because um, they they uh, uh, not because Medicare is reducing. What they're paying hospitals is because the uh, the costs uh, have been allowed to grow. Now, none of this is obviously absolute. Every hospital has its own challenges and, right. and whatnot. We also recognize the fact that uh, hospitals are expensive, and 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 costs in hospitals once they're they're in they're baked in uh, for a long time. So this is a this is a situation that it took uh, years, if not decades, to be in, and it's it's not something that's going to be turned around easily. Yeah. But what what I think what John and I would would like to convey is that the, the cost is is as much, if not more, uh, should be a focus of 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 solution as as uh, revenue strategies and payment strategies. And in your your presentation slide um, twenty two. The costs in our hospitals have been rising more rapidly in the last five years than they have in the 11 prior to that. Yes, it, it, it appears so. Um, uh, just again, we're just looking at, at the whole dollar. If we just look at the whole dollar costs, certainly there could be some volume in, influences on that. But um, uh, yeah, we are, we are seeing an uptick in the uh in the more recent yeah. more recent trend could that be yeah we, uh, we did sh we did show slight increase in, in adjusted discharges as the state's population went up that may be causing part of it um you know there may be other other causes as well i'm i'm glad that you, you brought up the volume part um because slide 20 it looks like at our biggest hospital there have been fewer discharges since 2011 about 25 percent fewer yeah. yeah, yeah, and and just one final question and make sure that I saw this correctly on slide 16. Um, there are numerous hospitals across the country who are making money off on Medicare reimbursement. Yes, so yeah. this, it's. It, yeah, I, I was just going to point out because I looked this up before the presentation that. <clears throat> There's a uh, eight hospitals in the peer group with the University of Vermont, half of your market share, and seven of the eight have a metric 95% or higher. Um, mo most of them, um, six of the eight, are over 100%. Um, so the median of 103 is is not just there's some very low and some very high. Uh, no. Most of them are in the 90 plus range. The The next lowest one is 85%. There's only one hospital in that peer group. Um, so it just demonstrates that 
and University of Vermont was not this way forever. When we look back that trend slide, they were in the 90 percentile, 92 or 94. Central Vermont and University of Vermont. One one of those was ninety two, and one was ninety four. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it, something's happened over time where their costs have just exceeded um, uh, revenue uh, trends, and that will put pressure <laughs> in the future. And whatever those business decisions uh, that occurred to to get there, we need to possibly start bringing some highlight to it and and saying okay we, you know we're not gonna maybe we need to unwind some of these uh cost trends and find some efficiencies within um more revenue is not going to do that more revenue will likely drive higher costs right right um infrastructure projects right. um thank you uh for coming and thank you for all the work um that you've done for us. Very much appreciate it. Maybe I'll just jump in. I just have one quick question. And again, thank you so much. Um, always insightful materials that are brought before the board. I'm wondering, this is building a little bit on um, board member Walsh's questions about um, managing to Medicare. And I'm wondering, are you aware of studies that identify what are the statistically significant factors, I guess, that would predict whether a hospital has been successful at making uh, a margin on Medicare? I'm just trying to think about, you know, the characteristics of the hospital or the market in which they operate in, um, you know, size, whether they're part of a system, uh, you know, are there ways to, to unpack um, what are those factors that tend to uh, increase the probability of making a margin? You know, I think that's the next step. Um, you know, if, if we knew that, um, we'd probably uh, be busier than we wanted wanted to be. Um, I, I do know that you know labor is always a huge issue. It always is one of the largest costs hospitals have to deal with. And um, I do know that uh, some hospitals institute labor productivity type uh, initiatives that do involve looking at their peers across the country, not peers at, at the hospital level, but actually peers at the department level. So they will pick a department and they will look at their labor for that department and they will compare that same department to uh, hospitals with similar departments across the country. And, and they're allowed to uh, see how they're doing. Now, my own personal experience, we, we did that at, at Centura Health, and um, uh, we had difficulty. We, we got peers for all our departments, and we got benchmarks for, for labor productivity at all our departments. And uh, we were well below the median as far as labor productivity. So our goal was to get to the median, and and we couldn't do it. And And I personally would put the blame on why we couldn't do it is culture. Um, uh, it, so, uh, it can be done, but the culture has to be, uh, there to do it. It has to be every, all hands on board. You all have to be heading the right, same direction and sacrifices have to be made. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't get to pe that piece of equipment <laughs> that you wanted. Instead, um, we need to, you know, uh, figure out how to, how to, how to tackle these issues. So, uh, culture is a, is a huge problem. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, Dave and one of the other board members. Um, a couple questions for you. Um, would you put slide 22 back up again? That was really helpful. Give me a second, thanks. Yeah, the, the general question is on, um, it, it, it's clear that cost growth is rising quickly, but the revenue growth being lower than peers contradicts, I think, a lot of, I think, what we're seeing on per capita spending rates and the KFF data that you can get online or um, other data that we see that our, that our actual uh, hospital-based spending has been rising at rates that are higher than this 3.7 to 4.3%. And given that this accounts for roughly 80% of the hospitals, I'm just trying to figure out, is that 
is that um i was just curious if, if you had any insight into that these data sets I, I, you know, I'm not I'm not aware what what other uh, um, metrics, uh, what, what other data you've had that, that indicate. So you're you're saying this this information may not jive with other increase information that you have, or yeah, I think we've been seeing a higher spending growth than 3.8 percent within the hospital sector. Probably, it's I think you'd have to like look at multiple different data sources to 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 kind yeah. of tight, you know, to triangulate around it, which is, I think this is the benefit of this project is it brings another data source and another way to think about yeah. the data. But I was just curious with that, you know, as you look through this data and you think about these data, how, how if there's a way that you could see where we're getting sort of different numbers, you know, lower numbers compared to peers. when we think when it appears that Vermont's rate of growth and spending is exceeding its peers. Yeah, I, I, you know, I guess it all depends on what, what, you consider the peers. Um, you know, John and I have made an attempt to, to to try to get hospital specific peers from from across the nation rather than just just regionally. Um, uh, that may be part of the difference. Is our peer group better or is our peer group worse? It, 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 it it's definitely hard to, hard to say. But obviously, if you're going to have different um, peers, you're going to you're going to end up with different results. The the other were you going to say something, John? Well, I was um, going to say that could be. Uh, something where we apply our analysis to the uh, peer groups that you had from a, a year or so ago. I, sorry, I, I missed the first part of the question as I uh, was bringing up the slide, so I punted to Tom. Um, but I, I, you know, we could um, take uh, instead of using the peer groups we've selected across the country, we could look at how things compare with our metrics to the peer groups you originally had, maybe a year ago in that report um or so yeah, yeah. i i think it's interesting maybe yeah. maybe you and uh, elena can sort of see if you can yeah. put, rectify <laughs> that um the other question i had is there was a discussion this morning brought up by the uh cfo of uvm health network about um, a lot of variability in how people fill out medicare cost reporting leading to the limitation for the usability of the Medicare cost report. And I was wondering if, if you guys had any insights on sort of the impact or the influence on variability and reporting on sort of these analyses and other uses of the cost report. Yeah, I, I mean, that's it's always a caveat, always, always a weakness. Yes, there can be variability in, in how cost reports are prepared and then some of the numbers that we're, we're pulling together out of the cost report. Um, uh, the overall all payer numbers, it's a question of, you know, what entities are included in those as to oppose to what the, the actual legal entity of the, the hospital look, looks like. Um, so we're always, we're, we're always going to have, uh, that, that caveat. However, there is no other source, a uh, comprehensive source of this information that is, is publicly available. Um, uh, and it's about as standardized as you can get. Um, I know American Hospital Association collects a lot of things on their, their annual survey. Um, it's, uh, uh, however, I do know there are weaknesses in, in that as well. You still have possible differences in, in accounting practices and methods. And uh, they also tend to fill in blanks for hospitals that don't report. In some cases, there are hospitals they reported numbers on that actually closed years ago. So uh, um, we we like the Medicare cost report. The data is available. It's available in a in a in a in a, in a format that uh, allows us to to pull all this information relatively collect uh, quickly for for all hospitals in the country. So, um, you know, again, that said, the Medicare cost report is for Medicare purposes, and and uh, some some parts of those those cost reports hospitals will be more diligent on than others if if uh, if, if it's not deemed important by the hospital or by the fiscal intermediary, intermediaries auditing that cost report doesn't don't feel it's important and, and don't audit it very closely. Um, you know, you, you end up with a possibility of bad data, bad data. But uh, again, it's the most standardized, comprehensive source of, of hospital uh, cost information that's out there. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I just add on a small bit that. Maybe they should take that up with the American Hospital Association to bring some more standardization across reporting. 
Um, but to knock the data that is their own data that they submit, I, I just I find the argument to be laughable almost. Um, that sure, yeah, criticize the information <laughs> that is uh, comparing you to others and possibly portraying you in a bad light. Um, I think as administrators, we need to get fed up with those excuses. So sorry, little personal and cynical response, but. I appreciate the color commentary. Um, um, when, go ahead, Tom. Just a, a follow-up question from um, not so much color commentary, but from a numbers standpoint. Um, if you have 4,000 hospitals in your data set, each hospital is probably trying to fill out the cost report to its best advantage. And so just the large number in the data set should kind of balance those things out. I think one organization arguing that they fill it out idiosyncratically or differently um, wouldn't be enough to explain a 27% differential, for example. Yeah. It's a good, it's a very good point, and that's how we feel as well. It's, it's a huge sample, um, uh, but it's also important. Don't just look at our stuff. Don't look at the cost report stuff, the, the RAND stuff. You know, see where these things start pointing directionally, uh, the same direction, um, and and uh, you, that way you can kind of refine um, you know what 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 you want to go after, what what you feel is confirmed by comparing uh, several several different data sources. Good point. Um, the healthcare advocate, do you do you have any questions or comments? Not right now. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. I appreciate it. It's very helpful. Um, all right. Well, um, I really appreciate it as well. A lot of important information here as we try to. Ensure the sustainability and affordability of this system in the strain that we're in in Vermont. So very insightful, and thank you for your time. Um, we have one last presentation by um, Nancy Kane. Um, Ms. Kane, are you here? Why don't we take a short break? I could use one myself anyway, um, and we'll come back at um. We'll take seven minutes. We'll come back at 2.55 for Nancy Kane. Great, okay. Um, we can resume our hearing. And um, Ms. Barabee, would you mind introducing Ms. Kane? I'd be happy to. Um, great, so Nancy Kane um, is a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, and she is contracting with the Healthcare Advocate um, and has been looking at um, financial statements and analysis and has a broad um, experience working with academic medical centers as a, on a board and in a financial, um, as a chair of the financial committee. So Nancy, I'd welcome and thank you for coming and any other background you think would be helpful, please um, feel free to dig in and I will share your screens. Okay, thank you, Elena. Um, yeah, I, I just had a couple things I'd like to share before I get started. Um, one is that I was on the MedPAC Commission for 2005 to 2011 when they first started doing that comparison of who's profitable on Medicare and who's not. And the number one predictor of whether a hospital was profitable under Medicare was when they did if they had low commercial share. In other words, if you have commercial payers, you get more money and you spend it. <laughs> so that was the early, at least the earlier years of what we found about who was profitable on, on the Medicare uh, payment to cost ratio. Um, anyway, so um, we can move on to the next slide, which is, I'm just going to talk about financial statements, which I've been doing for many years. My first job out of business school, which was, I hate to say how many years ago, but let's just say it was in the 70s. <laughs> uh, my first job was to help the Massachusetts Rate Setting Commission determine the reasonable financial requirements of hospitals. And at the time, the accounting and reporting was not standardized and it was a mess. But after a couple of years of working at this, I discovered that um, 
there, the answer to the question is there is no way to determine reasonable financial requirements of hospitals because they can always find something to spend money on. So that, you know, that's why I keep uh, trying to encourage my different parties that I work with to say, well, you know, the, the, the one element that the outside world has to let hospitals enforce on hospitals is the affordability of what they're providing and the, the need to be able to articulate an affordability limit and how much people have to pay out of pocket and what's happening with the insurance coverage and the commercial rates relative to income. There is no nice, neat little financial number that says, you know, profits should be 1%. So, um, so I can, uh, anyway, I've had a lot of experience with this and, and I'm uh, happy to answer questions about that. But the, I think that what, what you're trying to do is exactly what is needed. The way you're doing it is not ideal, but I think you're, what you're trying to do is say, there's an affordability problem. How do we address it? And I listened to the, a lot of the last presentation and I agree with them that, you know, you can spend a lot of money and have a reason to do it. But at some point you've got to say, no, the, the system the payers, the purchasers can't afford this. So let me move on to the next slide. Um, so what what are, I'm gonna talk about financial data. So what you just listened to was cost data, which is on the Medicare cost report. And I agree with the speakers that the Medicare cost report is probably the, the best document for understanding costs. Some states have better systems, but they're they're geared off the Medicare cost report. And, and then if you want to do comparisons nationwide, the Medicare cost report is the only thing available. But the Medicare cost report doesn't tell you really anything about financial health. Um, financial health, which we'll go into in more detail in a minute, is really only determinable by the audited financial statements. And one reason I like audited financial statements is that they're audited. And um, many of the reasons they're produced have to do with creditors. And you cannot... If you mislead a creditor, you can be sued. So the audited financials are, even though their accounting standards and, and reporting policies are not, not uniform, they are not as misleading as something you can just play with and there's no consequences. So audited financial statements are kind of the gold standard for, for, for uh, understanding finance. The financial side of things, other than the, is not the same thing as the cost side of things. It relates to how well an organization can meet its bill, can pay its bills, whether it can borrow or not, the adequacy of capital spending, how much cash it generates from its, its uh, operation. So it's a very different set of questions than a cost report. For you, it helped for, for your, the, the Green Mountain um, Board, that what it helps you say is, well, if we just did something to, if we just control, uh, limited somebody's rate, what does it look like the next year? How are they, how do they deal with Financially, how are they doing? Did we did we really hurt them, or are they still profitable and able to repay their debts? Um, it also helps you understand some of the bigger strategic issues that are affecting that hospital's or health system's financial performance. And also, I'm I'm often asked to help legislators define um, who's really advantaged and who's not, so they can alter health policy around um, really trying to. Um, help the distress, but not overly help the financially advantaged. So it helps you with those kinds of bigger, broader financial questions. Not So if you go to the next slide, it's not good um, in, in uh, determining if a hospital is efficient or a health system is efficient. It doesn't tell you whether they're more profitable on surgery versus medicine. And the one thing I'm asked the most often that it doesn't tell you is what's the one metric that tells me how healthy they are? So, I, you know, it just doesn't happen. Financial health is a pattern. It's over time and it's multiple metrics, which we're going to get into in a minute. So why don't we move on to the metrics? I think that's what's next. Here. Oh, yeah, let's first we'll talk about some of the challenges. Um, one of the big, I'd say the biggest challenge is most health policymakers are not financially literate. You know, they studied economics, they studied political science, they studied a lot of medicine, they studied a lot of other things. But financial accounting was probably the one course they said, I don't wanna go near that, it looks really boring. Well, it is really boring. Um, but if you're not financially literate, you can't really use financial statements effectively. There's an underlying assumption that the person using them is financially literate. So just that's a little uh, caveat because I've, I've looked at, in fact, the Medicare cost report financial data is, um, I'm trying not to find, I'm trying to use a polite word, 
but it's not usable. And um, what, whatever they said about Central Vermont being super profitable, well, it's 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 not. <laughs> I've seen the financials. It's not. Your 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 information is correct, but the Medicare cost report doesn't collect the, the data the way the audited's do, and it's not really audited. Another issue that makes it hard to use audited financial statements for people, particularly for people who aren't used to them, is that the entity can change. Depend and so you all might want to look at the hospital level, but the only real audited financial data right now is at the system level. And so, for, so your largest health system, University of, of um, Vermont Health Network, has a really good audited financial statement. But the data on the individual hospitals is not audited. It's it's out there, but it's not audited, at least not at the level that the um, that the system's data is audited. The other thing about audited financial statements, which is actually not, it's actually better than the Medicare cost report, but it's not available till three to six months after the close of a fiscal year. Now, Medicare cost reports are worse, so that that's okay. But it, we're not looking at the same thing. Um, another issue is what do you want to know about relative performance? You know, or their own performance over time, or their some peer group, state averages, um, what the rating agencies think, what the creditors think. So, how do you want to judge what you see in a particular metric? And then there's this standardized versus customized analysis. Like you said, I mean, I'm getting questions from um, the Vermont legal aid people that are very customized questions. The hospital claims, blah, blah, blah. Is it true or not? Well, that requires going in deep and understanding how do you translate what that question is into a financial, uh, financially meaningful argument. So those are some of the challenges. You have to be pretty literate and pretty used to, and, and healthcare audits in particular are really complicated. So uh, let's go to the next slide. That said, there are my colleagues and I that uh, I was working with um, Urban Institute for the last few years to come up with 12 metrics <laughs> that you can try to use to capture the basics. It doesn't tell you everything. Sometimes it just tells you where you need to take a deep dive. But I'm going to go over them briefly because it gives you a sense of the different types of performance each one of it, which is relevant to understanding financial health. The first two, total margin, operating margin, I think those are the ones most people understand. It's, are you profitable this year versus last year? Are you profitable at all? One thing you need to know about profitability, though, is that is one of the easiest metrics for management to manage. And I started writing about this in the 80s. You know, you can reserve, you can recognize something in the next period that you don't like having showing up in this period. You can move the revenue around. So it, you know, you really want to see it over multiple years. So the total margin is the profitability when you include both results from operations and results from, say, your investment portfolio or other non -perif other peripheral activities not central to providing patient care. Um, one of the wild cards in looking at the total margin, and this is one of the problems with the Medicare cost report, is that um, if you have the results of your portfolio, your stock market portfolio in your total margin, there's a couple ways to recognize it. One is what did you actually realize, interest, dividends, and things you sold at a gain or a loss. And the other big problem issue you could or couldn't might not recognize is how much the value of your market portfolio fluctuated between the, this you know at this point in time versus last year at the same point in time that's called unrealized gain and loss that's bigger than any profit margin you you can show and it fluctuates more so i leave it out and so do most credit analysts in looking at profitability because it's just valuation changes that change back and forth with the way stock market behaves. So the total margin is everything that they're doing, um, including non-patient related activity. The operating margin, when I'm standardizing and I'm trying to make it mostly related to operations and exclude sales of assets and other types of things. Um, but the operating margin is what you mostly want to focus on when you want to know uh, how they're doing this year. Um, from the rates that they're getting paid and the volumes they're achieving and the cost that they're trying to control. That's profitability. Those are the two big profit, but there's others, but those are the two big profitability metrics. The next two are liquidity measures. Equally important, how much, and actually I think liquidity measures are a better measure of resiliency of the ability to manage 
big challenges in your mar in your operating environment, how much cash and investments do you have? If you're sitting on ten billion dollars of cash, and you lose a billion dollars in a year, you've got nine billion dollars of cash left. If you're sitting on no cash and you lose, you know. $55 million that year, you have no resiliency, you might end up not being able to pay your payroll. So measures of your resiliency, your, your reserves and cash and investments is a very important metric that many places don't look at, but they should. Um, and then I, 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 I use this metric for just days cash on hand as a way to just make those uh, liquidity measures um, standardized for size. Uh, and then the next one, cash and investments, is just the money without standardizing for size. And we'll look at some of these ratios later on when I get to the uh, looking at uh, university, um, uh, looking at Vermont hospitals. The next big important financial metric, there's profitability, there's liquidity, and then there's solvency. Solvency is, okay, you borrowed to build your plant, which is good, but can you repay, can you repay it out of operating cash flow? And I want to, I'm not going to describe operating cash flow for you because if you're not financially into it, it's going to be like wet over your head. But you know you have a mortgage and you you know you've got a mortgage on your home, you need to pay it out of your operating your usually out of your salary. So you're how can you repay your debt on time um, as you know on an on a right on an ongoing recurring basis? That's that's really the solvency metric. So the two metrics, there's actually four metrics here on solvency. Long-term debt to total capitalization just says, you know, what's the mortgage relative to all the sources of capital you have for all your assets? How heavy a debt burden do you have? And you can throw in the pension liability because in some health systems, there's a huge pension liability. Uh, we can talk about that if you want to. You've got a couple that do have a big pension obligation that's actually bigger than their long-term debt. Um, then you can look at, the resiliency, the cash and investments relative to that long-term debt. So that if you can't generate operating cash flow, do they have savings accounts that can pay for it anyway? You don't want, that's not a good thing to do every year, but if you need it, it's there. And then debt service coverage is looking at how much do you generate from operations that can cover, how long, many times does it cover your mortgage? So those are, those are all important. If you can't, you might be profitable, but if you're not profitable enough and you don't have cash and you renege on your debt, you're looking at bankruptcy. So that's um, that's the, the solvency metrics. And then the last couple uh, that I'll talk about that are standard are, are, are the adequacy of capital spending. Um, and I know many people don't even want to think about that. You know, how old is the plant? Are they, may, are they replacing the plant at a reasonable rate? But the the number one reason I see um, health systems selling out to private equity or whomever is that they have underfunded their plant and or they've underfunded their pension. It's not because they're not profitable. It's just that the cat they haven't got the debt capacity or kept the cash around to maintain their plant and, and fund their pension. If you, all of you may be aware of Stewart Health System in Massachusetts, acquired all those hospitals, they were profitable. They just hadn't funded their pension or their plant for many years because the Catholic Church had a way of taking it out of the system for their own purposes. So the adequacy of capital spending is a critical long-term metric uh, that you would need to keep an eye on because if, if they're if they're an underfunding, eventually they become non-competitive and um, you know other then they often look for merger partners to help cap recapitalize them. The last two metrics um, are important to some states more than others, but it's really how much do you do for, how, how dependent are you on the government for Medicaid supplemental payment, and how much free care do you provide, free care and bad debt. And some people like to look at that from a, per, from a perspective of tax-exempt status and, and dependency on government um, politically determined funding like MSF, medical supplemental, Medicaid supplemental funding. So. Profitability, liquidity, solvency, adequacy of capital spending. Those are the four big areas. And then you can do some special studies on the, whether they merit their tax exemption or not or are highly dependent on Medicaid supplemental funding. Okay, uh, the next slide. Um, so one thing that one question is, you know, what sort of comparisons should we make? If we're going to look at Vermont hospitals, who should we compare them to? Um, and one option is a peer group. 
And I noticed we had a little conversation about that with your cost data. Um, another is just a judgment call. I used to do this with um, some states uh, where we'd bring in a bunch of numbers, you know, those finance, profitability, liquidity, solvency, adequacy numbers, and get a peer group of CFOs to look at chief financial officers to look at the numbers and say, are they advantaged? Uh, are they at financially adequate? Do they have red flags that we have to worry about? Or are they distressed? I, that weak is another word for distressed and need urgent action. You can do that. That's another. That's one way of of uh, saying how well someone's doing or not. Well, as opposed to saying they're better than their average or less than their average. You can just say outright they're in bad shape or they're in great shape. Um, you can look at how they relate to rating agency medians. One thing to be aware of with rating agencies like. Standard of Poor's or Fitch or Moody's is the only, they only have two to 300 health systems and hospitals in their database. And these tend to be the healthiest. You don't get in, you don't get a, an independent rating if you're a weak hospital or system. Most of the publicly owned hospitals don't go into the public markets for credit. They let their, their owner, the county or the city or the state borrow for them because they don't have enough resources. They're, they're too financially weak to do that. So the rating agency medians are the high level, the, the best the best of the best types of uh, ratios. And you can just look at your statewide average and say, here's how we do or we don't do. Um, so next slide. Well, if you look at Vermont, <laughs> it's kind of meaningless to do a statewide average or an in-state peer because one system is 70% of your <laughs> hospitals. Um, UVM health network, it should be N, sorry. So you can see it as, as the people, um, as the prior speakers mentioned, um, you've got a UVM health network with all the systems in it is 70% of your beds, your gross revenue, your discharges, your patient days. So um, it doesn't make much sense to say, let's compare them to a state average because they are the state average. Rutland is the next biggest, which is you know, not very big. And then you got seven others chopping up the rest of the 15%. So any kind of comparison there is just not going to be as useful as um, other types of comparisons. So what I thought I would do, but I didn't have a lot of time to do this, but if you go to the next slide, I said, well, why don't we, I've got it. I run a lot of data analysis for a bunch of different states and Massachusetts is one, Maine's another one, a bunch of New York. So I put a bunch of hospitals that sort of look like a UVM Health Network together. To say, let's look at UVM Health Network, that system, compared to UMass Health, which is the, comp the system I'm on the board of, Mass General Brigham system, which is, again, an academic medical, two of them, with a bunch of community hospitals. Tufts Medical Center, again, a big academic health center with three or four community health hospitals. Maine Health in Portland, which is actually, Maine Health is about a 60% market share in Maine. And then Northwell, which is in Long Island, but it's again, a big teaching center and then a bunch of community hospitals. So this is a convenient sample. You can't say, oh, they're doing better or worse than these guys, it means something. But all you can say is, it's a, you can get, a, you, we could add to this and make it a real analysis, but it's, this is illustrative to just show you what you can do looking for hospitals that are similar, health systems that are similar to UVM in terms of, Academic Medical Center, a bunch of community hospitals, they're all in New England or New York, eh, and, you know, whatever else. You can start doing more of this if you if you really want to get into it. So let's just see what this shows you, just so I can show you these profitability, liquidity, solvency kind of metrics. I'm going to start off, though, with one thing, which is called the payer mix. Um, and if you look at the legend at the bottom, um, this is in 2022. It's when I had everybody's payer mix. And payer mix doesn't change that much from year to year. So this is pretty good snapshot of the difference in payer mix across those five, six systems that I was showing you. So you'll see the look at the, on the commercial, I, don't, I can't point unfortunately, but to the far left, you see a blue column, it's, that's Mass General Brigham. And Mass General Brigham has almost 60% commercial pay on a net patient service revenue basis, which is pretty darn good. Um, the next one is close to 50 two or four, I can't remember the exact number, is UVM Health Network. Right next to them, same level of commercial is Northwell, 
dropping down his main health at about 50%. And then you get to below 50%, which is Tufts at around 42. And then the place I'm on the board of, UMass Health, which is under 40, about 38% commercial pay. So one thing that you, you can do a lot of studies of why a particular system is profitable or not, but one of the biggest predictors is your share of commercial revenue. The higher the share, the more likely you're going to be financially advantaged. That argument about cost shift is it's nice, but we did a study. Uh, it's in JAMA. We did it about two, three years ago, um, showing that um, the higher your commercial share plus your relative rate, relative Medicare, the higher your operating margin. So that's not to subsidize Medicare. That's not to replace what Medicare and Medicaid isn't paying. That's to drop it to the bottom line. Does that, you know, so this the whole cost share thing. Yeah, maybe you're helping to cover public pay shortfalls, but one of the big problems is the higher commercial share players have much lower public payers. They just don't have to cover as big of a problem, but they still have very high. These also, I don't put up their prices, but MGB has a pretty high uh, Medicare relative price. Anyway, what this shows you is there's a big range in, in your share of commercial revenue. And, and that's actually going to tell you a lot about how likely is they're going to be financially advantaged or not. So you can see the lower UMass where I am is the lowest commercial share. It's the highest Medicare and it's the highest Medicaid. We have the highest public pay mix. And so there's that. I just want you to see that there's a lot of diversity, even among academic medical centers with community hospitals in the system. A lot of diversity in the payer mix. And UVM Health Network is actually pretty advantaged in its payer mix. Um, next slide. So, sorry, this is really hard to, to see. Um, and I put the Fitch medium in there. Um, but let's just look at the dark red, the bright red line is UVM Health Network. And you can see that it's hovering in the bottom third of my peer group. Um, Tufts is this darker line that's coming out really, and by 2023, it's it's uh, the worst. And I took out 2022 because Tufts was actually a minus 17% operating margin in 2022. And if I left it in, everybody else would disappear into a flat line. So Tufts is basically really struggling. Um, and that that black line should be much, much, much lower in 2022. I just put it at zero because I couldn't make the graph work. Um, the top line, the purple line, which is starts, it's a it's about the second highest, is is the Fitch median for the 300 so systems in their in their database. They don't have a 23 out there yet. So it's well, actually they give an interim one. So you can see the Fitch median sort of drifting through there, that purple line. The blue line is Maine Health. The yellow line is Mass General Brigham. The black line is that black is UMass Health, and then North and Northwell's um, is a green dotted line. UMass Health uh, really got clobbered in 2022 by the rising labor supplies, supplies and labor costs. But um, we were actually. You'll see on the total margin side, we were able to actually offset that with asset sales. Not a good way to make a profit. We sold off a big chunk of a joint venture and made enough money to offset our operating loss in 2022. But that's what that, so the difference between an operating margin and a total margin is you bring in non-patient care related activities and see how that affects your profitability. There you see, and so if we move the total margin on the right side, the column, the, the graph, UVM doesn't do, doesn't look very good. It, it's total margin starts at 2%, drops to a little below 1% negative, and then comes back to zero, whereas the others mostly stay above it. Um, that's partly because uh, the UVM doesn't have um, a lot of a big cash portfolio with a lot of investment income, whereas some of the others really do. Or, and they're not selling off their assets the way UMass did. Okay, next slide. So one of the things though, and I said, I wanted to just illustrate that you're operating, that sometimes you wanna understand why that operating margin is where it is. And so the blue line, this is the UVM HN Health Network operating margin. The blue line is the reported margin. 
the red line takes out the losses that the health system is experiencing in New York. And the gray line takes out both the New York hospitals and the net medical school subsidy that they're using, they're expensing in, in lowering their operating margin with. And that, when you take those two strategic decisions out, you know, own hospitals in New York and raise your net subsidy to the medical school, if you take those out, you see they're not that far from the Fitch median. So this is just to illustrate that, you know, you can see these things, but then you often want to know more. And um, that's that that should, there's a two percent margin difference depending on you know whether you include the, these two items the subsidies um, and, or or exclude them and those are strategic choices. Okay, next slide. Okay, so going on to liquidity now. We looked at profitability. Now we're going to look at days cash on hand. Uh, don't worry about all the extra explaining, but I'm, I'm I'm taking out anything they owed Medicare and Social Security when they did these COVID-related advances, because some places have a huge amount. And what you'll see is UVM, um, yeah, 150 goes it drops down in 2022, 23, partly because the value of their portfolio goes down, partly because they have to repay Medicare. Um, UVM, they're a lot like UMass Health. Uh, Tufts goes below 100 days because they're losing so much money that they're pulling down their cash every year. Uh, Maine Health is, we all kind of had a dip in 2022 because of the uh, labor and so labor shortages, uh, but they're still well above 100. Uh, Northwell is cutting it kind of close. They're well below 100. The credit ratings agencies start to say, if you're below 100, you don't know, you're, that's one feature that's not investment grade. It's below investment grade. It might hurt your bond rating. And you can see the Fitch median again, the, the, the wealthier hospitals are between 200 and 300, 200, 250 on the median. So, but from a liquidity perspective, um, Vermont University, Vermont Health System is okay, not great. And then the next slide just gives you a sense of um, the total amount of dollars. And MGB has um, in 2020, 2021 had 14 billion dollars of cash and investments. So that, so one question is: Is that a good idea? Is that good? And um, let's just say that UMass General Brigham has has been so advantaged over time that it's been able to accumulate that accumulate that much wealth that it is now drawn the ire of ratepayers and regulators, and they've had to. Uh, deal with a cap on their revenues and a performance improvement plan requirement from the Health Policy Council, and the state's kind of crashing down on them and not letting them add on other hospitals or open ambulatory surgeries. <laughs> they're really pushing hard on them because they're saying you shouldn't have that much, you shouldn't have made that much money that you can set aside $14 billion. So it's good financially, but it's not so good from a public policy perspective to be that, that rich. But that's an advantaged hospital just so you know what one looks like. They have plenty of resiliency. They can absorb losses much better than any of the other guys that you see on this list. Um, next, and that's why I mean liquidity is so important. You gotta see what kind of resiliency they've got. Uh, then the adequacy of capital spending. This is this ratio called the average age of plants. It's not great, but it's the best we've got. Um, and you can see um, the system, University of Vermont is, you know, 10 to 12, right in the range with uh, the, actually with the, what Fitch considers normal 10 to 12. I didn't put Fitch in here for some reason. And UMass Health is, um, we're, 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 we're okay. We, we, we put a lot, we spent a lot of money in 2023 relative to earlier years. Tufts um, is quite old. Not only are they cash poor and, really unprofitable, but they're really old. That is the death knell, because you can't borrow the money to bring down the edge of your plant. MGB doing fine, youngest plant next to Northwell in, in New York. Maine Health is a little older, but they're in this, they're all, you know, you can see the U University of Vermont system is actually right in the pack with sort of the okay hospitals. They're not um, real young and they're not real old. And then the cumul, but then when you look at the cumulative capex to depreciation, what that means is um, depreciation is a way of recognizing the using up of a capital asset. So you build a building, or you better to think you have a a piece of equipment that has a seven-year life, 
and you spend $100,000 on it, but you're going to allocate that $700,000 over seven years. You're going to say it's going to live seven years. Depreciation expense is going to be one seventh of the capital expense. Well, it generally, the, you want to be able to say, I'm saving that money to replace that piece of equipment. And it's not only going to be, um, uh, what did I say it was? <laughs> $700,000 when I bought it, it's going to cost $800,000 to replace. So you'd like to see CapEx, the capital expenditures, to keep up with depreciation over time and be a little better than depreciation. But what you see during this terrible financial period for most everybody between 19 and 22 is two to three of these places didn't go above one. Tufts did spend a lot, and that's, but they couldn't bring the age of plant down because they were starting off pretty old. So you can see uh, University of, of Vermont Health Network is, is under underspending on capital in that five-year window um, and probably should, will have to start spending more soon to be able to keep up, just to keep up their build, their build, mostly their equipment and make their facilities competitive in, in, the, uh, in the academic medical environment. Um, next slide. Oh yeah. So then the so you, you let's just say you need to you need to invest in your capital. One question is, can you borrow to do that? Because nobody fully funds their capital expenditures with internally generated funds. They mostly go out in the market and borrow a little bit. Um, anywhere, I would say between thirty and forty percent. This if this ratio of pension lease to total capital utilization at the pension lease a long-term debt over your total capitalization, 40% 40, 40 or below is considered pretty healthy. Um, UMass is a little above that, and we brought it down over time. Tufts is way over that, and that's mostly because their equity has been to, uh, undermined by their losses. MGB is well below it. Maine Health is well below 40%. Um, University of Vermont is right at, it doesn't have a huge amount of debt capacity, but it's 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 managed. It, they can do some, they can add debt capacity. Um, but their ability to repay that, so the next ratio over is debt service coverage. Do they generate cash from operations to make their mortgage payments, basically? Um, and they're, they're right on the edge there. You've, the University of Vermont's a little above 1.5. Uh, we're better, mostly because we've sold off assets. Tufts is bankrupt. Tufts is under receiver, not receivership, but they're being managed by their creditors at this point. MGB is good, a little tight, but they're okay. Uh, Maine Health is very good. Northwell, lots of debt service coverage, and then you can see the Fitch healthy, really healthy hospitals have over to, between two and four usually debt service coverage. So um, that that's another aspect. That's the solvency. Can they go out and borrow in the market and get a decent credit rating and repay it from cash from your operating activities? Okay, next slide. I think we're getting close here. Oh, um, one other thing to say is I've been showing you the network, the whole the system, their financials. The medical center alone is quite a bit more profitable than the system. You can see it's uh, it's to it's operating margin there, and then if it is around uh, now, not good in twenty or twenty two, no one's was, but they were two to three percent in nineteen, twenty one, and, and twenty three in their operating margin. Uh, once again, they don't have much investment income uh, coming in, so their total margin is very close to their operating margin. Now, most of the subsidy to the University of Vermont Medical School comes out of the expenses of UVM Medical Center. At least according to the footnotes, if that wasn't true, you would see that uh, the medical center has profit, other than the two really bad years, of around four percent, which is very. Let me just say a very respectable operating margin, three to four percent, very respectable. Um, now it's obviously respectable enough that the medical center has felt financially comfortable enough to transfer ninety-three million dollars out over the five-year period to the other affiliates in the system. So again, there the medical center is sort of what I would call the cash cow for this for the whole system. Um, it, it's 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 just the healthiest of the group that I've seen, and I've I've looked at Central Vermont, and I can just they're 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 not they're not they're financial. They would be probably 
they'd have to be a very different place because right now they're not financially viable without the affiliate loans and subsidies they're getting from the system. Uh, okay, you can see uh, the medical center not only has transferred 93 million, but they've also lent another 87 million out to affiliates. Transfers are just, here you are, here's the equity, you don't have to pay me back. A loan means you're supposed to pay me back. So UVMMC is sort of the, the cash cow that everybody's um, getting their, their sustenance from. Uh, next page. Oh, I think I just threw I just threw this in so you could see that you can look at transfers among affiliates within a system. The uh, audited financials have a consolidating schedule, and it shows you who's transferring money. The way it works is mostly UVMC is a negative number, which means they're transferring out. Mostly they're transferring it to UVM Health Network, which is then transferring it out to these other places. The, the parent gets it, and then it transfers it back out. And if you have questions about that, I'll be happy to come back to it. But it's um, it's it's in the it's in the audited financials. You can see these transfers. But what's what's not shown in a transfer are revenue and expense items between the the um, the different entities. Um, but that you probably don't need to see those necessarily. Um, okay, and next slide. One more slide. So my takeaway, which is that. Sorry, a little interruption here. Uh, takeaway, my takeaway, and I, I'd love to hear yours, but you may not want to give it, is that the system really did survive a terrible three-year period. 21, 20, 20, 21, 22, hospitals all over the country, health systems all over the country had a really tough time with the labor shortage, supplies and you know, and staff shortages and people retiring. And it was a mess. And I was I've been on the board at UMass since 2018, I think. I've never, I've never it was really rough. It's been really rough. So they survived. They didn't thrive, but they survived. They also have, have been able to maintain those strategic choices that have reduced their profitability and their liquidity. Um, but they do probably, and they probably, and they've delayed capital expenditures as have many systems to get through that period of crisis. Um, so those are the kind of takeaways you can get from that. And it, it, it's, it's not a precise, oh, absolutely, they're rich and should be punished, any kind of thing. It's just saying they're doing okay, uh, not terrifically well. They're not advantaged, they're not Master Arnold Brigham, but they're not toughs either. So I'm going to stop now because that's a lot of information. <laughs> and I have to get off in about at five or four because I have another commitment at four. So um, we've, got, we've got 20 minutes to deal with some questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kane. I'll open it up to the other board members for questions or comments. Good afternoon. Sometimes Nancy. they're shy, but if you stay quiet long enough, they'll pipe in. Um, I do tend to be shy and wish Robin would go first, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you, Nancy. I, I got a lot out of that. Um, I guess I have a couple questions, and I'm not sure how well I've put them together from you know, jotting down notes, but. Um, Nationally, have you seen um, more trends with fewer days cash on hand as the cash has been moved to investments? Or are organizations trying to invest and keep the day's cash on hand high? So in my analysis, an investment in a financial asset, I count as cash. And they, they do that when they, if you're a creditor and you want to know if you're going to get paid, you don't care if they've got it in stocks or bonds, as long as it can be liquidated and paid, pay off the debt. <laughs> so, okay. you know, so I count any kind of investment that's a financial asset. Now I, I exclude in my day's cash on hand, anything that is obligated um, to a, a debt service fund or other, or, or a self-insurance fund, they usually call them trustee held or some type of legal obligation on those funds. Yeah. And I also exclude donor restricted funds. And you can do that. Again, it's, I don't okay. recommend it for beginners, but you can, you can identify available cash and investments that are board, you know, under the control of the board. Okay. So uh, um, there's a lot, you know, and, and, and um, I, what, during COVID people were really, 
a lot of people were very upset that the institutions that got the most support had like billions of dollars of cash sitting there because medic, you know, CMS didn't think to look to liquidity. Nice. So, <laughs> so, but you can measure it absolutely, and you can, and there has been, you know, just because of over time, a lot of places have accumulated enormous amounts of cash. Yeah. Um, early on in your presentation, you you um, had some you you commended us for what we're trying to do. Um, and that was nice. <laughs> and then you said, but there could be better ways to do it. And I wonder if you'd elaborate on that a little bit for us. Yeah. So a couple, so I've had a lot of experience trying to control healthcare costs 40 over 40 years. Um, my initial job was saying, let's, you know, was Massachusetts rate setting where we did what they called charge control, which is kind of what you're trying to do. And we went through unit prices, which was impossible. We went through global prices, which was difficult. Uh, at one point, we finally said, oh, let's just give it all over to the private sector and the managed care companies and hope everybody negotiates a good rate. That didn't work too well either. <laughs> uh, and and, and I was MedPAC, you know, we were always trying to think of how do you make keep Medicare affordable? Because on the one hand, hospitals want money. On the other hand, the trust fund is running out and Congress is threatening to do all kinds of crazy things. So you're always struggling with how do we be fair to hospitals and health systems uh, and, right. and make sure there's access out there. It, 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 there is no magic bullet. The thing I like the most, and I was on this special commission in Massachusetts back in 2010 or 12, I forget. We came up with, it's not perfect, but it's been evolving. We came up with a per capita health expenditure cap. So what that is, is it takes all, and they use the data from um, uh, all payer claims data, as well as um, some other source. Anyway, they, they can, Chia, Massachusetts, Chia, Charles Chia can tell you all about how they do it, but they take all the funds that go out, are paid out in healthcare, and they divide it by the per capita, and they look at an average rate of growth, per capita rate of growth for health expenditures for physician services, hospital services, pharmacy, outside of those formal places, um, out-of-pocket expenses, and they want it to not exceed the rate of growth in um, in um, the, the state GDP. That's their affordability metric. So what I'm saying is you you can they you can be argued into increasing the rates a hundred percent based on what health systems say they could use, because they can. <laughs> but you've got another group of people over here who have to pay it. And they're not in they are very, very important. I mean, I I, I got motivated because I used to be a physical therapist and I saw the damage that being uninsured or underinsured can do to a patient and a family. It, it It's heartrending. So that's on the, you know, it's a tough balancing act that I admire you for trying to do this. I think you've picked a couple of metrics that are pretty hard to rationalize down to a limit. Got it. Well, I appreciate your candidness with us. Um, I too started off as a physical therapist uh, yeah. 25 years ago. So I did not know I've read a lot of what you've written, but I didn't know that about you. So um, thanks for sharing that too. Thanks again for coming today. My pleasure. I'll ask one, um, Ms. Kane or Elena, or Dr. Kane, can you go to the, um, the slide with the transfers, the out of MC to the network to others? Yeah. That really long slide is back a couple, I think. There, yeah. oh, back. Yeah. One more, one more forward. One more to the, towards the end. There, this one. Yes. Yeah. I just wasn't clear on what some of these were. What What is obligated group eliminations? Oh, uh, well, so when you're looking at an audited uh, consolidating schedules, um, what they're saying is what, what UVMMC gave out the $2.2 million in 2023, and, and uh, um, Central Vermont gave out, um, it is eliminated by virtue, it, it got, went to someplace else within the system. So system-wide, it's zero. It nests to zero. Got it, okay. When so it all gets here... put together, it nests to zero, or very little, a very okay, small so... number. 
And so then Porter is the beneficiary of some of these transfers, Alice Hyde, Home Health and Hospice. Yep. Okay, I get it. And then the loans, is there information in the financials as to the terms of the loans and when those loans are due back or what the payment schedules are? Nope. No, and I, I'm, I mean, as I was looking at Central Vermont, they have a loan, uh, I think it's around a $30 million due to affiliates, due to related parties. I don't see how they can ever repay that right now. <laughs> so, you know, as I say, I think they're kept, they're paying their bill vendors, but I don't think they can pay their affiliate. And then this might be a matter of corporate law, in which I'm a little fuzzy, but can the network direct the subs, CVMC or UVMMC to do this, or do they have to act independently in making their decisions as to whether or not they want to loan out the money? I suspect that uh, the, every every system is, has got its own governing documents that are not necessarily uniform. But from the way this looks, I'm guessing that the board at the system level has the ability to to do this. But that's not, I don't know the answer to that. Obviously, they're doing it, so someone's letting them do it. Um, it's not uncommon. And then the transfers to the medical school, where is that on here? It's not. So the trans, the medical school subs, I'm calling it a subsidy, is an expense. It lowers operating income, mostly of the medical center, from what I can tell. And how much money is that on an annual basis? Well, so first, just so I'm saying the net amount, the gross amount was much bigger, but let me just look for a second. The, the net amount, here it is, I've got it here. Sorry, I have a lot of pieces of paper here. Thinking you might ask some really smart questions like that. Um, oh. no, it's not the we net got three amount other board about, members to go, so we'll get there. Okay, the net amount is 20 to 30 million, but the gross amount is about um, 70, 80 million. So they get yeah. amounts, from, they had this Medicaid GME, Revenue that comes in, it's 40, uh, it is, well, it was 30 million, then 52 million, and then, and then 72 million. It kept going up, and so did the subsidy. And so the amount that they end up absorbing without having revenue from Medicaid was about 20, 30 million a year. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I didn't have anything else. Thank, thank you. This was really insightful and incredibly helpful. Thank you. Can I just follow up with one question on on the medical school topic while we're talking about it? It, it sounds like you've reviewed audited financials from multiple other networks, definitely at least UMass. Is this a common thing to do for a hospital system to subsidize a medical school? Yes. And it's also and a this... common it's also a common source of intense fighting. So and fighting between between the medical school and the and the health system. So there's a great story if you have to read more about that. There's I can send you stuff to read, but you may know about the there's a health system in um, Minnesota, uh, Fairview, which acquired University of Minnesota Hospital uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and agreed to pay the university gazillions of dollars. And when and they had an a, a, an academic integration agreement. And when that agreement came to time to be renegotiated, Fairview said, we want out. <laughs> and they exited. <laughs> so these are there's fights about how much this should be. And I can send you some interesting inter information. But yeah, it's it's not uncommon. Um, I think it's I'd like to write a paper about it because I don't think people are aware of how much the patient care system is subsidizing medical education. And I think medical education is wonderful. I just don't think sick people should pay for it. I think we need to find other sources for medical education. And it's very hard money to track. So you want to know what does the medical school do with that? Well, they don't tell us. And UMass does that. We send money to the medical school and we don't know what, what it's going for. Now we love the medical school, we love the docs and the faculty, but we don't know, and, and you know, having been an academic myself, I can tell you, I can see, wouldn't it be nice to have somebody subsidizing my, the grants that didn't get funded? 
or the or the research I want to do and no one wants to pay for it, or you know the teaching that no one wants to pay. You know, wouldn't that be great to have a source? So anyway, I'm just I'm just kind of saying that it's an unaccountable but gigantic bill that is not publicly, you know, not the source of enough conversation. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation too. My pleasure. Dr. Kim, what's the um, the other entities? What might be in that bucket on this slide? Yeah, I don't know. They don't. Again, they don't. Um, they don't tell you. <laughs> but um, probably I could dig it out if I looked at the footnotes and all the different entities that are not named, but are named not named in this slide, but are named somewhere in the document. So it's something I could find out. Try to find out. Um, okay. So I'm looking at audited financials. Another source of interesting information, not always consistent with the audits because the entities are different, is the IRS Form 990. And sometimes they'll name all the affiliates that are with a particular organ, uh, uh, um, tax exempt organization and tell you any relationships. It's a lot of work, but um, I don't know who those are, but I can go find out. The one that took 37 million gave, no, not I mean, uh, that uh, took 14 million was, and then 13 million, That's that's a lot of money. Right. Okay. If you stumble upon it and happen to see it, certainly I'd be interested. Yeah, Thanks. I'll take a look and see if I can find it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? Just to follow up on that, for example, we know that Porter uh, subsidizes a nursing home, for example. Would yeah, that, so is that something that potentially could be in? Well, Porter is produced, Porter's financials are um, usually presented as consolidated with that nursing home. Oh, okay. So whatever it's sending to the nursing home is is, is, is sort of shown in. up as a consolidation. Got yeah. it, got it. Okay, thanks. Same yeah, thing with was, Central Vermont, yeah. Yeah, and then this is probably what you mean with the 990s. Um, so like a lot of the hospitals have charitable dollars that they send out or they support uh, the extra money for the Blueprint Community Health Team, stuff like that. So I don't know how that shows up, but just that, Owen's well, that's question made me think about that. Yeah, those oh, are usually okay. expenses. Yep. yep, got it. They most show up in the 990 as part of their community benefit, but it's an expense. It, it's the, it affects operating income usually. Cool. Okay, thank you. Um, does a healthcare advocate have any questions or comments? No, just a big thank you. Great opportunity to learn from you, Nancy. I'm glad that I had the opportunity to study under you as a student. Um, so thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, we have about five minutes um, and we can take uh, public comment via the raise the hand function. Um, Devin Green. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Really appreciate all the information that's been provided today. All the folks I've worked with at hospitals are very data driven. So this has given us a lot of information to work with uh, as we move forward. I just wanted to address a couple of things quickly in some of the presentations, and I'm not sure if we have all the presenters on, so maybe they could follow up um, as we as we move forward with this. But for the RAND report presentation, one thing that we noticed was Vermont has fluctuated in their average relative price since the presentation last year. Um, and there were other states that also fluctuated, such as Hawaii and Washington State, and we were wondering, there are large fluctuations. Vermont went for went from the bottom third to the top third. Um, same with Hawaii and Washington, and we we're just wondering if there was um, analysis underneath that or explanation for it. Um, and then for the Bartholomew and Nash presentation, we we. Um, have noticed that with Colorado and for them to do the Washington State Health Authority, they really place an, eff an emphasis on stakeholder process and engagement with their data. 
we really admire the thoroughness that they did that. So we do look forward with engaging them, uh, engaging with them further as we move forward. Um, and then for Nancy Kane's presentation, thank you for the presentation. That was very um, helpful and informative. My only, my only thought was in one of those initial slides when you talked about the hospitals and how the health network makes up the majority, you spoke about Rutland and then seven other hospitals, but we have a couple more hospitals um, in Vermont <laughs> as well. So I was just wondering, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to make sure if, if uh, those were all included. Um, I think there are three, three hospitals that could be missing. Um, but otherwise, I uh, found that really informative and appreciated the analysis. Um, we really do hear the concern on costs, and we will partner with the state to address the root causes of what we're seeing. Um, we're concerned with what we're seeing, seeing here today. So whether it's hospital culture, patient acuity, economies of state, worker burnout. Um, we are going to partner with the state to do what we can to ensure access to quality care for all Vermonters. So thanks for starting that conversation and uh, we'll continue to move forward. Thank you, um, Devin. Any other public comment? Great. Um, well, I appreciate everyone attending today. This is a really um, important day and it's it great to get it uh, done. Um, so doc, Dr. Kane, thank you very much. And um, is there any other new or old uh, information, new or old business for the board? And I will move to adjourn. Second. Third and fourth. All in favor, say aye. Aye. <laughs>